Due to the nature of the content contained within this video, viewer discretion is strongly advised. This video is not intended to hurt, harm, or disparage against a particular group of people or religion. My only aim is to present to you the truth with no bias. If you believe in your U and your Usha, you are no enemy of mine, but I will be forthcoming in this presentation. Barashith or Genesis 3 14 through 15 and Yahuwah Aluah said unto the serpent because you have done this you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon your belly shall you go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his hill. This scripture that I just read to you is indicative of a prophecy of the seed of the woman, who is the Messiah, Yahusha Hamashiach, but also denoting that the serpent would have a seed. Bereshith, Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And it came to be when men began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of Aluah saw the daughters of men and that they were good or beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And Yahuwah said, My Ruach, or my spirit, shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh and his days shall be numbered 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of Aluah came unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Kanuk, Enoch 3, 1 through 10. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the Malachim, or angels, the children of the heavens, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. And Shamiazah, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great transgression. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. And then they swore, they all together, and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were in all two hundred who descended in the days of Yerod or Jared on the summit of Mount Carmoon, and they called it Mount Carmoon or Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And these are the names of their leaders, Shamiazah, their leader, Urakabaramaal, Akibaal, Rumaal, Gukabaal, Damiaal, Donaal, Azakaal, Sarakniaal, Asaal, Armarus, Batraal, 
Ana Aw, Samsaba Aw, Atra Aw, Tura Aw, Yumya Aw, Azari Aw. These are their chiefs of ten. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they begin to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 3,000 cubits, who consumed all the acquisitions of men and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. The Book of Giants, chapter 7, verse 2, or Kanukar Enoch in the Sefer, chapter 7, verse 11. And they conceived from them and bore to them great giants. And they bore to them three races first, the great Nephilim, the great Nephilim brought forth the Nephilim, and the Nephilim brought forth the Aliud or Eliod, and they were growing in accordance with their greatness. Canuke, or Enoch 105, 1 through 3, after a time my son Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamach. She became pregnant by him and brought forth the child, the flesh of which was white as snow and as red as a rose, the hair of whose head was like wool and long, and whose eyes were beautiful. When he opened them, he illuminated all the house like the sun, the whole house abounded with light. And when he was taken from the hand of the midwife, opening also his mouth, he spoke to Yahuwah Zadok, or Yahuwah of Righteousness. Then Lamach, his father, was afraid of him, and flying away, came to his own father, Methuselah, and said, I have begotten a son unlike to other children. He is not human, but resembling the offspring of the angels of the heavens, is of a different nature from ours, being altogether unlike to us. So we can understand from this passage that when Noah was born, his father was completely afraid of him because he looked unusual according to the other people on the earth at that time. And he makes it very, very clear that this child looked like the offspring of the fallen angels that we just looked at previously. This gives us a clue as to what the Nephilim looked like. Now we know that Nuak or Noah was an albino because his hair is described as like wool, as we see with many of the biblical Israelites, including Yahusha and many others. So we can, what we can deduce from this scripture is that it was very unusual for the inhabitants of the earth at the time to be born with white skin. And based off of Lamach's reaction to the birth of his son, we know definitively based on this passage alone that the fallen, their children, the Nephilim, were white skinned. This is why Lamach makes such a reaction to his child, Nuak or Noah, being of whiter skin. Here are some images of some albino people, and we can see that they're still Negroes with Negroid features, but also the woolly hair, the lips, the nose, and all the things that we know that are exclusive to Negroid people. Now, I believe that this is one of the reasons why the book of Kanuk or Enoch was removed from the biblical canon. 
Let's continue. Shamuth, Exodus, chapter 4, 6 through 7. And Yahuwah -uh said to him, Masha, or Moses, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, and see, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and drew it out of his bosom, and see, it was restored like his other flesh. Bum Adabar, Numbers 12, 1 through 10. Now Miriam and Aharon, or Aaron, spoke against Masha because of the Cushite woman he had taken, for he had taken a Cushite woman. And they said, Has Yahuwah spoken only through Masha or Moses? Has he not also spoken through us? And Yahuwah heard it. And the man Masha was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly Yahuwah said to Masha and Aharon and Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three came out, and Yahuwah came down in the column of a cloud, and stood in the door of the tent, and called Aharon and Miriam, and they both went forward. And he said, Hear now my words. If your prophet is of Yahuwah, I make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Masha. He is trustworthy in all my house. I speak with him mouth to mouth and plainly, and not in riddles, and he sees the form of Yahuwah. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Masha? And the displeasure of Yahuwah burned against them, and he left. And the cloud turned away from above the tent, and look, Miriam was leprous as white as snow. And Aharon turned toward Miriam, and look, a leper. So we can clearly see here, we have two examples. We have Masha, where the Most High Yahuwah turns his, his, the flesh of his hand to a leprous tone and then changes it back to the rest of his other flesh and we also see the most high Yahuwah cursing Miriam with leprosy so we can clearly see that the Hebrews were dark-skinned people which makes sense as to why going back to Nuach or Noah and him being born to his father and his father having this adverse reaction to how his son looks now when you look at the Torah and the laws concerning leprosy that could only apply to people of a darker skin tone. So we have to ask ourselves, where did white people come from? Let's take a look at one more example. Malachim Shani, 2 Kings 5, 20-27. Gehazi, the servant of Ali Shah, the man of Alua, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramee or Aramean, by not accepting from him what he bought. As surely as Yahuwah lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to see me from the hill country of Afarim. Please give them a town of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them the two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. When he had went in and stood before his master, Ali Shah asked him, Where have you been, Gazi? But Ali Shah said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chair to meet you? Is this the time to take money, or to accept clothes, or olive groves and vineyards, or flocks and herds, or male and female servants? Not Amon's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gaazi went from Ali Shah, presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. So we can see from these few biblical examples, white skin was a curse, proving once again that the Hebrews were darker skinned people. Now we're going to take this a step further, and we're going to talk about Esau and his descendants and the individuals that dwelled 
in the mountains of Mount Sire and who they were. Let's take a look at the scriptures. Barashith, Genesis 25, 20-26, and Yatsak, or Isaac, was 40 years old when he took Rabka, or Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bathuwal, the Arami of Fadan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Arami, or Aramean. And Yatsak prayed to Yahuwah for his wife, because she was barren, and Yahuwah answered his prayers, and Rabka conceived. And within her, the children struggled together. And she said, if all is right, why am I this way? So she went to ask Yahuwah. And Yahuwah said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples shall be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. And when the days were filled for her to give birth and see twins were in her womb, and the first came out ruddy all over like a hairy garment, so they called his name Ashu, or Esau. And afterward, his brother came out, with his hand holding on to Ashu, or Esau's hill. So his name was called Yaqub, or Jacob, and Yatshak was six years old when she bore them. Now, before we move on, it needs to be made clear that Yaqub and Ashu were twin brothers. But you notice in the scriptures that Ashu is described very differently than Yaqub. As a matter of fact, Yaqub or Jacob is not even given a description. And we read later in the scriptures that in order for Yaqub to be able to pass as his twin brother Ashu or Esau, he has to wear the fur of goats because Ashu was extremely hairy and ruddy. This does not mean that he was not melanated, but he was a very hairy child and man growing up. Now we're paying attention to this and pointing this out because it's going to be very important to understand about who his descendants are to this very day. Let's continue. We will now take a look at Esau's descendants as well as the generations that came from him and his genealogy, which brings us a little bit closer to the truth. Let's take a look at what the scriptures say. Now all of Ashu or Esau's descendants are completely laid out in Barashith or Genesis 36, which is a very, very long chapter. But there are a few descendants and a few wives he took that I want you to pay attention to. And that's what we're going to look at in this particular section of the video. This is Barashith or Genesis 36. And we're going to read 1, 2, 8, 9, 10, 12, 19, 20, 21, and 22. And this is the genealogy of Ashu, who is Adum or Edom. Ashu took his wives from the daughter of Khan Anan, Ada, the daughter of Elun, the Kafi, or the Hittite, and Halibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zabaun, the Kafi, or the Hittite. Now, what you're going to notice is that a lot of these people and these women that Ashu mixed with are not from the genealogy of Noah and his three sons after the earth was repopulated. But let's keep going. So Ashu dwelt in Mount Shair. Ashu is Adum, or Esau is Edom. Now this is where things get very, very interesting because we start looking at the genealogy of these individuals that lived in Mount Shair, where Esau ended up settling. And this is the genealogy of Ashu, the father of the Adumim, or the Edomites, in Mount Shair. 
and these were the name of Ashu's sons, Aliphaz, son of Adah, wife of Ashu, and Ra'u'al, son of Bashama, wife of Ashu. And Thamna, or Timna, was the concubine of Aliphaz, Ashu's son, and she bore Amalek to Aliphaz. These were the sons of Adah, Ashu's wife. So we can see here that Ashu, or Esau's son, Aliphaz, had a child with this woman named Timna, and she brought forth to Esau's son, Amalek, who is one of the descendants of the Nephilim. So who are these people that Esau is mixing with? Because I can tell you right now, this child that Esau's son had with Timna is not fully human and neither is she. And I'd venture to say that Aliaphaz is not fully human because he is a descendant of Esau's seed and the son of Ada, who genealogy is also not connected to Nuach, Noah, and his three sons. We can see here that Esau is mixing his seed with the descendants of the fallen. Let's keep reading. These were the sons of Ashu, who was Adum, and these were their chiefs. And these were the sons of Shair, the Horite who inhabited the land, Lutan, Shubal, Sabaun, and Ana. And Dashun, and Asar, and Dishan, and these were the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Shair, in the land of Adum, or Edom. And the sons of Lutan were Kari, Himam, and Lutan's sister was Thamna, or Timna. So, let's do a little bit more research into Shair, because we can see that these inhabitants of this land are who Esau, or Ashu, mixed with. So let's take a look at the strong concordance for the word Shair, and let's see what comes up. That will give us a better understanding of who or what these people are because if their genealogy is not mentioned or connected at all to Nuach or Noah and his three sons, they are descendants of the fallen. Let's take a look. So if we pull up the word Shair, or Sierra, we get the word satyr, goat, devil, hairy, or rough. Now let's take a look at a further definition. So as we look at this further definition, like I said, it mentions a goat, a buck, a sacrificial animal, or a satyr. So I literally got this by looking up the word Shair or Sair, where Esau dwelt. These were not human beings. These were descendants of the fallen, and we can see by looking at this definition, they might have possibly been human animal hybrids, which took place during the days of old when the Nephilim roamed the earth and they were mixing. The Bible says that they defiled themselves with man and with beast. They were mixing genealogy. So Esau was laying down with cave dwelling hybrids. There are a people that descend from these beings, even to today. And I'm gonna prove that. Let's keep going. Now, all we have to do is look up the word Kuri or Kurim. In English, they call it the Horite or Horites, and we can clearly see that the definition describes them as cave dwellers, troglodytes. There's only one people on this earth who dwelled in caves. We've already proven the original inhabitants of the earth were dark-skinned. So it would make sense that when the fallen angels came down and slept with the women of the earth who were obviously black, there was a mutation, a genetic mutation that took place that caused human beings to experience a change in genealogy. 
The people that you're looking at on your screen are what you would call today Neanderthals or cave dwellers. These are who the Kurim or the Horites were, cave dwellers. Why did they dwell in caves? Because they couldn't handle the sun. They had no melanin. So when Ashu or Esau mixed his seed with these Neanderthal descendants of the fallen, this is where white people came from. This is a genetically recessive gene that they had. This is where the bloodline of the fallen comes from even to today. And I'm going to show you guys some evidence of this. I just wanna show you guys some of the documents showing the white races of Europe. And we can get a better perspective as to who the Moors were fighting. These are the albinos and the beasts of Europe. And the Moors were fighting these people for hundreds of years prior to the so-called transatlantic slave trade. And one interesting thing I wanted to show you is that when you look at these beasts and albinos and how they have achieved what they've been able to achieve in just a few hundred years, keeping in mind that they were considered wild men just a few hundred years ago. And they had no last names. Many of them didn't even have first names. And I wanted to show you this because I found this very interesting. If you see here the wild men, and you look at the clothing that the people are wearing to the left, you can see here they're wearing this clothing to cover up their hairy bodies. So I found that very interesting. And something else I found in the British Library was one of the oldest genealogy charts, one of the first ones made for white people. And as you can see at the bottom of that genealogy chart, you see two wild men. So they're showing that their ancestry comes from the caveman. So that should give you something to think about considering that just a few hundred years later today we have people like the Queen of England who claim to be of the royal bloodline of Egyptians and Kushites who ruled the earth. They even found the remains of a boy who was buried at Stonehenge in Europe. He was buried in Europe but he actually came from the Mediterranean Sea in Africa and he came to Europe 3,500 years ago. So that's in 1500 BC. So we're told that the Moors arrived in Europe in 700 AD, but here we have black people out of Africa coming to Europe over 2,000 years before the Moors arrived in 700 AD. All right, so this is an article from the Natural History Museum, and it says, the studies compare the genome of a Neanderthal with those of hundreds of modern humans, both from Eurasia, where our ancestors met Neanderthals, and from Sub-Saharan Africa, where there would have been no interbreeding. The Neanderthal genome comes from the toe bone of a female individual, and the modern human information comes from data banks of genetic codes. Now listen to this. The research has found Neanderthal DNA in regions of the human genome associated with skin and hair, suggesting early humans leaving Africa benefited from interbreeding, perhaps giving them thicker, straighter hair and skin that helped them cope better with the colder Eurasian climate. So it's literally saying right here that the Neanderthal gene is where you get straight hair from. Proof of what we looked at when it comes to this genetic mutation that I've been talking about. Let's keep going. All right, y'all. So I got some things I wanna show you guys. So we're jumping over here to the browser. Uh, I'm not gonna waste too much time. I got a lot of stuff to show you guys to further prove everything that I've presented in this video so far. So let's go ahead and let me share my screen and let's take a look at what we have here because we got a lot of information to bring out. Let's get to it. So the first thing we're going to look at is this book, which is called The Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind, Peopling of Countries, Etc. This was written by 
Benjamin Franklin. And this book was published in 1751. Okay, so this book is from over 100 years ago. All right, so let's take a look at what it says. Now, I have the PDF here, but I want to uh, focus here on page 224 and this last paragraph right here because it tells you some things that I think are very interesting for you to know. So it says, which leads me to add one remark that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. All Africa is black or tawny. I mean, we already know that. There's no mystery there, right? But let's keep reading because it gets very interesting. So it says, and chiefly tawny, America exclusive of the newcomers, holy so. And in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans also. Now, what does swarthy mean? Let's take a look at the definition of the word swarthy, and we will get our answer. Swarthy, meaning dark skinned. So what is this telling us? Benjamin Franklin is telling us that the original inhabitants of these European countries were dark skinned, which proves what I said earlier about how when Noah or Nuak was born, it was very unusual for someone to have pale skin, proving not only that the Yasharalim or Israelites were black, but everyone on this earth was black. And we already talked about the genetic mutation that took place earlier in this video, and I'm gonna show you some reports to prove that, but this right here supports what we said and what I showed you earlier. So let's keep reading. The Saxons only accepted who with the English make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth. I could wish their numbers were increased. And while we are, as I may call it, scouring over our planet by clearing America of woods and so making this side of our globe reflect a brighter light to the eyes of inhabitants in Mars and Venus. Wow, this dude really believes in outer space. That's crazy. <laughs> Um, why should we in the sight of superior beings? Okay, you see this? Why should we in the sight of superior beings darken its people? Why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America where we have so fair an opportunity by excluding all blacks and tawnies of increasing the lovely white and red, huh? But perhaps I'm partial to the complexion of my country for such kind partiality is natural to mankind. So obviously Benjamin Franklin had a problem that there was more black people on this earth than there was white people because obviously we were here first. I mean, we are the first people of creation. It doesn't matter if you are a Hamite or if you are a Japhite or if you are a descendant of Sham or Shem. You know, we every nation at one point was dark skinned, including Ashur Esau himself. He was melanated. He was ruddy, but he was not white. He was melanated. But we know where white skin came from. OK, we've already proven that But we're going to keep on going. Now, the reason why I'm showing you guys this is because there's something very, very interesting that I want to show you guys, which is this tapestry. So let's take a look at that real quick. All right, so this is the website blackcentraleurope.com. Now, if you guys are interested in looking into this stuff yourself, I will leave, if I can remember, I will try to leave the link in the description so you guys can look up these sources yourself just in case you want to do a little bit more digging, okay? So this says Black Central Europe, as we've proven, the original Germanic speaking people were black, the Moors, the Moorish black people, okay? Um, it says... We bring you over a thousand years of black history in the German speaking lands and show you why it matters right now. Okay, so before I read this, I want to show you this. This is the tapestry. This is part of the tapestry, it's not the whole tapestry. But if you look here, you can obviously see two swarthy or dark skinned people. Okay, and you have the king right here and you have the queen right here. They were obviously dark skinned. Okay, now let's read what it says. It says, this remarkable medieval tapestry depicts a battle between giant wild men. Okay. And by the way, this tapestry was made in 1440 Germany. Okay. 1440. So I want you to pay attention right here where it says this remarkable medieval tapestry depicts a battle between giant wild men. Now, Keep that terminology in mind because as we move further in this study, it's going to start making more sense. But it says giant wild men. 
Okay, and I'm gonna show you the full tapestry in a second, but I just want you to remember giant wildmen clothed only in forest products or perhaps their own hair. So these giants and these wild men had hairy bodies, huh? Just like Esau. They were descendants of the Nephilim, just like the Horites. And what else does it say about them? Let's keep reading. And the civilized defenders of a castle, who are these black Moors? Of course, most notable is the contrast in skin color and the reversal of our expectations that white should denote civilization and black the lack thereof. The wild giants with their unkempt hair and beards attack with sticks and stones in the other two sections of the tapestry. They battle with the lion and the dragon and the unicorn, heraldic symbols representing authority and power, and then present gifts of a wild game to a mother and a child in a cave. So not only did they have hairy bodies, not only were they giants, not only did they, you know, invade these lands of these black moors, but they also dwelled in caves and they had an unkempt appearance, just like the Neanderthals. Yeah, it's all starting to come together, isn't it? Let's keep reading. In case we were thought as doubt as to the level of civility among these white men, one of the gift givers has prominent fangs, huh? So they had fangs. Nephilim? Yeah. The black defenders, by contrast, inhabit a fortified castle and fight with bows and arrows. The men's neatly groomed beards, robes, and headbands identify them as Saracens or perhaps as black converts to Christianity. Their king, queen, and princess watch anxiously from the keep while heralds call out for assistance. So we're going to take a look at this tapestry here. This is the tapestry. Let me show you a better picture. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, these are the wild men, okay? And I'm assuming that these weird outfits that they're wearing is a mixture of the vegetation from trees and from leaves that they use to cover their body, and the rest of it is their hair because they had hairy bodies, okay? That's clearly what it says. And you can see these black moors, you can see them in the castle, and you can see that these other moors here are depicted with bows and arrows fighting against these wild men. You can see the unkempt beards and you can see there's obviously a difference in complexion, okay? So this is just one of our witnesses to support what I have presented in this video so far. Let's keep going. All right, now we're gonna talk about the satire because I talked a little bit about it, um, you know, and just uh, earlier in this video, we talked about how if you take the word Sair, which is where Esau and his descendants, as well as the Horites, dwelled, if you break it down in Abari or Hebrew, you get this. Okay? Now, we're going to read a little bit about this. We're not going to read the whole thing, okay? But we're going to just get a, a rough idea as we continue to go through this study. So it says, in Greek mythology, a satyr, also known as a Silenus, is a male nature spirit with ears and, and a tail resembling those of a horse as well as permanent exaggerated e-word. I'm not going to even say that out loud. Early artistic representations sometimes include horse legs, but by the 6th century BC, they were more often represented with human legs. Comically hideous, they were ma they have mane-like hair, bestial faces, and snub noses, and are always shown naked. Satyrs were characterized by their ribaldry and were known as lovers of wine, music, dancing, and women, and they were companions of the deity Dionysus and were believed to inhabit remote locales such as woodlands, mountains, and pastures. So they also dwelled in mountains or dwelled in caves, okay? And they often attempted to seduce or R word nymphs and mortal women alike, usually with little success. They are sometimes shown. Ugh, I'm not going to even read that. It's disgusting. And by the way, the, the, these acts that I refuse to say out loud is something that the Romans and the pagans were known for. These deplorable acts in the bedroom amongst people. It, it, was, it was completely deplorable. I don't even need to say more than that, but it was just straight up perversion. All right. Now, let's go here. Um, you can see this uh, depiction of a satyr, and you can see that it kind of looks like the wild man. It's got the hairy, unkempt appearance here, and it's, it's dwelling in the woods. Okay. 
So let's read this here because it does mention it in a scriptural context. So it says, on the other hand, a number of commentators have noted that satyrs are also similar beings in the belief in ancient Near Eastern cultures. Various demons of the desert are mentioned in ancient Near Eastern texts, although the iconography of these beings is poorly attested. Beings possibly similar to satyrs, including Sarim, okay, are mentioned in the Bible several times. Or Shair, that's what we looked up earlier, was the standard Hebrew word for he goat, okay? But it could also apparently sometimes refer to demons in the form of goats. They were evidently subjects of veneration because Uyakra or Leviticus 17 7 forbids Yashrilim or Israelites from making sacrificial offerings to them. And 2 Chronicles 11 15 mentions that a special cult was established for the Sarim of Jeroboam. Like satyrs, they were associated with desolate places and with some variety of dancing. And Yashiyahu or Isaiah 13 21 predicts. But wild animals will lie down there and his houses will be full of howling creatures. Wow. Very, 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 very interesting. All right. Now we're going to keep on reading because we got more to get through. Okay. Now, this right here is the deity in, I believe, the uh, Greco-Roman Empire, or actually Greek, the Greeks. This is their deity, which they call P-A-N or Pan. Okay, so you can see he's very similar to the satyr. That's what I'm saying. They were all pagans. Every nation around Yasharal, every nation that was outside of them were pagans. They all worshipped the same deities, just with different names. But this is Pan, and you can see it looks just like the satyr. You can see the horn deities. You can see the horns and everything else. And this is where we get the, the modern day version of the Baphomet, as well as the goat of Mendes. You know, this goes way back to these creatures, and these creatures obviously existed around the time of Yasharal because we mentioned that the Nephilim were mixing with, you know, mixing genetic code with animals and defiling themselves with beasts. So it would make sense why the Horites would probably look something like this or be similar or descend from these beings because we know that the word satir means goat or hairy goat. Okay. All right, let's keep on moving. All right, so this next uh, study we're going to look at, or this next portion says, Wild Men of the Ancient World, Legends Across the G-L-O-B-E. We don't believe in the globe over here, but you know. Hell of a humanoid beasts, are they real? Now, before I read this article, I want to make something clear. The so-called caveman, the so-called yeti, the so-called Bigfoot is the Neanderthal, okay? It's not a myth. It's not it's not false it's true the neanderthal is the so-called bigfoot the so-called yeti the so-called wild man okay they use all these different terms to try to make you think it's fiction when it's really true it is true it is a fact and we're going to continue to prove it okay so it says, man-like beasts appear in myths and legends of cultures around the globe. The best known wild man phenomena today as a Sasquatch or Bigfoot in North America. That's the Neanderthal, by the way. But there are other legends such as the Yeti or Abominable Snowman. Okay, hold on. Let me fix that. Abominable Snowman said to live in the wilds of the Himalayan mountains, Europe. There are many lesser wild human crypt, humanoid crypt, uh, cryptids. The orange padded, which is said to have lived in the remote forest on the island of uh, Sumatra in Western in Indonesia. Almas in Mongolian folklore and the Bukit Tima monkey man or the year, uh, blah, 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 okay. Um, the legend of Bigfoot and other wild men seems like a modern concept, the controversial and hotly debated Patterson film reportedly shows footage of a live Bigfoot taken in Orleans, California in the autumn of 1967. The widespread attention the film received brought the concept of Bigfoot into the public domain and into the modern popular culture with movies and TV shows such as Harry and the Hendersons inspired by the hairy humanoid caught on tape. So if they have a video, I'd be happy to check it out. Let's see.
Okay, I don't think that had anything to do with what we just read, so we're going to keep on moving. So it says, but these legends of wild men are not just a global phenomenon. They are an ancient one. And many of these myths have prevailed for hundreds of years, being passed on from generation to generation as people swear to have seen evidence of the humanoids themselves. Of course they did. They walk amongst us. We see them every day. They are amongst us. This is not, you know, a, a folklore. This is not a myth. This is this is real. Okay. So it says the early surviving mention of a wild man is the Inkidu in the Epic of Gilgamesh, written more than 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Once again, another pagan nation. Uh, the Enkidu is a central fixture in the Epic in which he's described as an uncivilized savage who was raised by animals and lived with herds and a game in the wild. He is the embodiment of the natural world and is the opposite of the cultured and eloquent hero Gilgamesh. So this actually makes a lot of sense when you really think about it because it says that we were called savages right in slavery they said that the african slaves are nothing but savages and animals and they gave us culture but when actually in actuality that was them because we were talking about the moors earlier what people don't know about the black moors is that they taught these causacoid wild men how to wash themselves they had no structure they dwelled in caves they didn't know anything about structure right so, you know, people might be offended by some of the stuff I'm saying, but after all the dirt that's been thrown on, on Yasharal's name, we are going to clear the air. We are going to bring the facts because sour cream supremacy is losing its edge when information like this is being revealed, even with what the scriptures say. All right. The whole purpose of white supremacy is because they knew that they had insecurities about us. And so they created these lies to hold themselves to a higher standard when they're the ones who are the, who dwelled in caves. They were the ones who had no structure. They were the ones who were eating flesh. They were the ones who were hairy and unkempt that didn't know how to wash themselves. I'm just saying, let's keep going. Unlike many other wild men and other legends, Enkindu is able to be tamed. He's taught the ways of the civilized world by a prostitute. Wow. Shamhat, after spending seven days enjoying her company, which resulted in the animals rejecting him when they sensed her human scent on him. All right. Now, let's read this. It says the ancient European wild men. Both Greek and Roman myths are filled with sexually voracious wild men. The satyr and fawn are both wild men associated with fertility, paganism. I told you, just like Ishtar, you know, and Semiramis and all these deities, they are all connected to paganism, which is fertility. This is where you get these pagan holidays like Easter, which is named after Ishtar, who is the pagan fertility deity. Okay? You see how it's all connected. Both the Greek deity pan and the roman equivalent faunus are depictions of the wild man figure and both are deities of nature and the wild but also of fertility and you can see this is a depiction of pan trying to get down with a uh, with a goat i mean are you shocked this is what the romans did this is what the pagans did this is why the most high told us in the torah not to do these acts not to participate in homosexuality, not to lay with animal, not to lay with beasts. This is the heathens that did this stuff. This is all heathenistic. Let's keep going. It says, the Romans also described a Celtic figure called Ducios. They compared their pagan deity to their deity Faunus and the Greek deity Pan, but are careful to emphasize the nature of, or the savage nature of Ducios to differentiate differentiate between him and the their own wild men Ducios is not just a fertility deity he is described as impregnating both animals and women either by surprise or by force doesn't this sound so much like what the Nephilim did that or not the Nephilim but the fallen when they came down and they took these women for wives and then the Nephilim end up being born and then they started defiling themselves with animals man beasts eating flesh and all this wicked stuff that they were doing who eats bloody meat more than anybody else? The wild. Let's keep going. It says, historians believe these figures are all rooted in ancient legends from Neolithic cultures across modern day Europe and Russia. They point to the Slavic creature known as the Leshi, which is described as a short humanoid forest guardian with 
with a large bushy beard and tail. Alessi is rumored to capture children and travelers if they do not respect his forest. Although some people have linked the Leshi and creatures like the Satyr, the Leshi is not associated with fertility and is closer to modern Bigfoot legends than the Greco-Roman concepts of wild men. Huh. Very interesting. All right, we're going to keep on moving. All right. Now, this is another book that I'm going to show you guys. And this is also about the tapestry that we looked at a little earlier, okay? So we're going to take a look at this. And by the way, this is the book. It's called um, A South German Tapestry, Bulletin of the Museum of Fine Arts, Volume 56, number 303, Spring 1958 is when this was published. So let's read what it says. It says, it is indeed a matter of contra uh, contrulation that the first German tapestry to be acquired for the museum should be outstanding example of an important period in the history of European tapestry weaving. The purchase of this tapestry, once a part of the Sigmaringen Ha Hazel uh, I'm, I'm slaying these right now collection was made possible through a fund established by the bequest of Charles Potter Kling though precise dating of the tapestry from evidence now available is not possible there are many reasons to believe that it was woven sometime during the last decade of the 14th century or the first decade of the 15th century the subject of the tapestry startling at variance with the subjects of other tapestries in the museum's collection presents an enticing iconographic puzzle Beginning at the left hand end of this long, narrow strip of tapestry, probably intended to hang above a row of benches, we follow the actions of strange, bittered men clothed in handsomely styled renderings of the traditional hairy covering of the mythological wild man. So we have another witness proving that these beings, these human, these so-called humans being depicted were hairy. Just like the Bible says, Esau was hairy. It would make sense if he mixed with Neanderthals that the people that come from there would be hairy. That would dwell in caves. Let's keep going. Orned with stones and branches, the wild men approach a moated castle defended by dusky or swarthy or dark-skinned moors just like i told you the black moors of germany and of europe from the upper windows of the castle the king and queen watch the approaching horde the attackers in contrast to the dark skinned the dark skinned defenders are giants there we go again another witness this is a whole nother book talking about this tapestry and they are both sources are identifying these as dark-skinned Germans that are fighting against giant wild men, okay? Let's keep going. But though the danger seems overwhelming, the drawbridge is drawn and two bowmen advance towards the invaders. To the right beyond the castle, a wild man crowned with flowers struggles with the lion. Two wild men attack the winged dragon. While still further to the right, another wild man grasps the horn and right leg of a spotted unicorn in an effort to subdue him. The small trees which puncture these incidents have smooth, uh, sinuous, brown trunks each species of tree indicated by the variations of the elaborate polychrome patterns of the tuft of leaves at the top birds flock to one tree to feed on its berries and so on and so forth but i just wanted to show you this to show you another witness backing up what we looked at in the tapestry okay let's keep moving all right so this next thing is from jackinthegreen.org and it talks about the wild men of Wartburg and we have another depiction of the tapestry here. Let's take a look at it. Okay, kind of hard to see, but you can see more wild men with the unkempt beards. Okay, you got one right here riding on an elk. Okay, now you can see that they have these olive leaves around their head, which is very interesting because when you think about a lot of the Greco-Roman deities, a lot of them were depicted as having this, this, these olive branches around their, around their heads that they wore as crowns. Okay, and there's another wild man there. There's the unicorn that they were talking about. You got another wild man right here. You've got one over here with a lion on its back, and you look how small the lion is. This is a full-grown lion. This is not a cub, and you can tell it's a full-grown lion because you can see the mane of the lion and you can see this wild man carrying him but look how small the lion is compared to this wild man these people were giants they were nopheline okay 
And you can see right here, there's this Nephilim wrestling what looks to be another lion. And again, you know, we saw this image earlier with the swarthy or dark skinned Germanic people. Okay, let's get back to the article here. All right, so it says the glorious medieval uh, tapestry of Wartburg Castle of Wild Men and Moors is a German, probably Strasbourg, Alsace, from about four, 1440, fusing both pagan and Christian metaphors. Mm, interesting. So we read in the article that these Moors had converted to Christianity or were Christians. We know that some of them were Yashar Alim, right? But not all of them were right but we could see that these deities were obviously these nafilim were obviously pagans right it depicts a series of scenes of left to right wild men attacking moors in the castle wild men fighting with a lion dragon unicorn oh, you read all that okay we'll just get past that and uh yeah this is what we looked at earlier okay we'll keep moving it says the black inhabitants of the fortified castle fight with bows and arrows the men's meatly groomed bears okay we read all that okay all right and here's another close-up of it, and you can clearly see dark-skinned people, okay? And we're going to keep on moving. I don't want to get too sidetracked here. Um, this is the unicorn, obviously. This is the lion. Er, everything. Like I said, this is the lion. And look how, look how small the lion is compared to this wild man. And like I said, you can see these olive branches around their, their heads, which is very, 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 very prevalent in Greco-Roman civilizations with their deities. <clears throat> Let's keep going. All right, so this is, it says the Wild Mandel Tons. Uh, I think this is German, so I'm not going to even try to read this, okay? But it says the ritual is dedicated to the Germanic deity Thor. Once again, paganism. And involves 13 men of all whom belong to old local families who have been living in the region for centuries. The men's costumes are made of moss, which grows only in the Alagu Alps. So you can see that these men are doing some sort of ritual. And who they are in the likeness of is the wild men. And if you look, you can see even the olive, olive tree branch around their heads. And you can see the long beards and the hairy bodies. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, it says the custodians of the wild Ma Mandotan's ancient ritual dance. And I'm going to show you a video of what that might look like. Here's for what is probably oldest cult or ritual dance in the German speaking area, the wild Mandel Tons. It is the goal of the association to preserve this and pass it on to posterity. The dance is only performed once every five years if we have received it from our ancestors. Hold on a minute. These are their ancestors. I see blue eyes. I see white skin. I see blue eyes. I see white skin. These are their ancestors. This is what was passed down to them because they are most likely, if they're their ancestors, they are descendants of the Nephilim. There it is. They're literally admitting to you that these are their ancestors. And if you look at this image right here, it's very, very closely resembled to this. Look at the beard. Look at the hairy body, the shaggy hair. Look at it. And you can obviously see the olive tree branch around their around their their heads, their crowns, right? Look at that. This is very telling, y'all. You can't deny this. Let's keep reading. It says 90 citizens from all walks of life founded in the Folk Association on April 28, 1901, of the Gastoff Zurzon in Obas. Today, the largest costume club Germany with thousand members can look back more than 110 years of club history. Since 1901, the wild, the wild Mandel Dance is organized by the Mountain and Homeland Security Association in Oberstdorf. And since then, reenacted every five years, it is an honor to be allowed to join in. And in general, only members of long established Oberst Dorstoff families are invited, all of whom belong to an old local family who have been living in that region for centuries. And you can see here is another depiction. Look at the hairy body. Look at the shaggy beard. These are their ancestors. They said it themselves. Yetzer didn't say it. I didn't I did not say it. They said it out of their own mouths. Let's keep going. It says Oberdustorf is a mun municipality and skiing and hiking town in southwest Germany located in the Algal region of the Bavarian Alps. Oberstdorf is one of the highest market towns in Germany. It is the southernmost settlement in both Bavaria and in Germany overall. 
so this is in germany guys so this gives more credence to the wild men and we realize this is not a myth it is not a myth and here's more images and isn't it very very interesting that you have the um this cross looking thing right here isn't that very very interesting because you know the cross is pagan right i hope you know the cross is pagan anyway let's keep going <laughs> <clears throat> It says the wild Mandel, a pagan, a pagan civilization. I'm going to highlight that a pagan civilization in Obolsterstal, Alagu, Alps. The wild Mandel ritual used to be spread over the whole Alpine area from the high caves to the Tatras and the Dolmanites up to the Hars to the high caves. Once again, these are cave dwellers and the through Ringian forest, but only in one place in the Alps has the dance been preserved in its original form in Opsterdorf in the Algal. It is one of the last of the pagan civilizations that was able to protect itself under the protection of the remote Opsterdorf mountain valleys. There we go, there's another picture. It says, survival of the wild Mandel Tons is a ritual of protection. While the dance only survived in Opsterdorf after it was once widespread throughout the Alpine region, this is a question with no straightforward answer, but there are some clues. The origin of the wild mandel dance undoubtedly goes back to the mysterious world of prehistory. The purpose of dance is said to connect with the forces of nature, the stars, and the deities, pagans, especially the deity Donar or Thor. Only a few hundred years ago, the term Osterdorf represented the combined territories of the forest, the wilderness, and the unexplored mountains. Uh, I would also probably assume that that includes the Caucasus Mountains. <clears throat> this may be one reason why reason, or one reason why reason, this, uh, okay, why this ancient leg legacy has been maintained in Osterdorf. This is another interesting story about the ritual, which also helped to maintain the loyalty shown to it by the locals. And there you go. There's another picture right there. All right. We're going to keep on going. Um, yeah. Wow. Very, very telling. Whew. Boy. That is very telling, y'all. I don't even know what to say. There's more pictures right there. Wow. Look at this. This is obviously a ritual. And look, there's not a black person in sight. It's all Europeans. And they right there in the middle of the wilderness doing this ritual. Wow. Look at that. Europeans. Nothing but Europeans. There's another image right here. It's actually kind of fascinating when you think about it that they put this much this much effort into honoring their ancestors. Uh, I guess I guess you could consider this a European form of ancestral worship. Alright, we're gonna keep on moving. Alright, so um I, this is about the tapestry so i think we're gonna just skip this because we already read about that all right now this is another one of those ritual dances i don't think it's the exact same one that we just read about but let's just take a look at it and see what we uh what we got here now keep in mind you see this hairy deity or this guy dressed up in this costume you can see the hairy body you can see the hairy face okay and you can see that he has this tree in his hand which is representative of the club because we read about in the tapestry that these wild men were carrying clubs just like the caveman okay so keep that in mind And you can also see the, the you know, the, the bushes and the vegetation around his body. And if you look here, all you see is Europeans. That's all you see. I mean, are you guys starting to really see with both your eyes open what this is about and where these people come from? You will not find black people gathered at events like this. You won't. Wow. All right, so I guess that's one of the forms of the ritual dances that they do. We're going to keep on moving. All right, so these are the Wilden Clausen. 
okay? And if you look, I, I believe these are another um, pagan deities that do ritual dances and you can also see the horns, you see the hairy bodies, you see that they have like the goat heads and the, you know, the they give homage to Pan, you know, one of those pagan deities, okay? Not really much to see here. All right, we're gonna keep on moving. All right, so this next thing says, depictions of giants, Middle East wild man, or Neanderthal. Huh, how about all three? All three rolled into one. All right, let's see what this says. It says, myths in Europe and the Middle East contain giants, either as the ancestors of humans or as dangerous adversaries who exist in the wild and who often attacked humans. Huh, okay. We assume that the giant refers to a very tall creature, but giants are described by the Greeks as having great strength and are not until later depicted in art as being tall, but of human size. Okay, so we already know that there was three races of giants, so that's not exclusive to them being extremely tall. You know, they could be regular sized people. I mean, when we talk about the Horites, they are not necessarily described as being giants. So they were, and then like I said, I believe that they come directly from the Aliud or the Elioid. Okay, so that was the third race or the third generation of giants that was born from the um, Fallen. And so it would make sense that as the Nephilim begin to multiply, they got smaller and smaller and smaller. But let's keep going. Could these giants have been small surviving groups of Neanderthals or HNHS hybrids driven to the edge of extinction by Homo sapiens? Estimates of Neanderthal extinction have been pushed forward to within 30,000 years ago and possibly 20,000 years ago. We know that that's baloney. The earth does not know 30,000, 20,000 years old. This foolishness. Okay. A time frame that is not outside the possibility of being remembered as a significant chapter in human history with Neanderthals included as important beings in core human myths. Over arguments over who was Neanderthal, focus on trivial physical characteristics, but our true question concerning this creature's humanity. Our arrogance is challenged by our definition of who counts in evolutional history. There is no evolution. Anyway, the Most High, Yahuwah, created everything. I mean, except, of course, the Nephilim. If it is only one species that matters, us obviously, then we must reject Neanderthal along with the millions of species that have already rejected as inferior novelties on the road to ourselves. <clears throat> the Middle East was a Neanderthal-rich environment. Lines carved into Humbaba mass could indicate scarification. But around the mouth, these lines often compose a full mustache. Other lines follow facial contours and may also depict hair and a very hairy wild man with a large mouth and prominent teeth emerges. The flat winding versions below have been claimed to be intestines. Huh. Intestines. Very, very interesting. I mean, they were cannibals. All right, let's keep on going, y'all. Just keep on going. Keep on trucking. All right, who has the most body hair? Drum roll, peas. Whites are the hairiest with Mediterranean, Southern Europe, and Shemitic people. Now, when it says Shemitic people, I'm assuming they're talking about the Arab people, who obviously do have more Shemitic blood in them than the Ish people, right? Because the Ish people came straight from the Caucasus Mountains of Khazaria. Right. So they wouldn't be Shemitic, but I'm assuming that they base this study off of them because they are also very hairy. But that makes sense because they're descendants of Esau. But we already know that the original Arabs were also dark skinned, swarthy black people. And the Arabs that we see or the Palestinians we see now are literally just Turkic Mongols who, when the Ottoman Empire ran into the so-called Palestine Middle East, they mixed and colonized the indigenous dark-skinned Palestinian Arabs that were there. And as a result of that, you get the Palestinians you see today. Um, so it says, tending to be hairier than the Scandinavians, the Anglo-Saxons, Africans are in the middle. The least hairy people are Asians and um, American Indians. So it says, we saw above how the reasons for difference in body hair are not totally clear. For instance, Caucasian people are hairier than the Japanese, even though 
testosterone levels are the same. The difference seems to be in how sensitive the hair follicles are to those testosterone levels. It makes sense for Africans originally from a warmer climate to, to need less body hair than those from the frigid European areas. Huh. Yeah, that says a lot. All right, let's keep on moving. Okay. Exploring the enigmatic or enigmatic Roman deity fauna a tale of fertility and power there we go again with the paganism and this is how you know easter is pagan because i told you that ishtar is the deity of fertility and you can see the rabbits okay this is where easter comes from semiramis isis venus all of these deities are pagan and they all represent fertility okay so keep that in mind but just remember this uh this video when you when people are telling you happy easter just remember they're telling you happy ishtar day essentially well, we, that's why we don't do paganism we keep the biblical feast days of the most high yo can't wait till pesach or passover is coming up get ready for spring all right let's go it says Fauna, the Roman deity associated with fertility and wildlife, holds a significant place in ancient Rome. That's why Christianity teaches you to celebrate Easter. Yeah. Religion and mythology believed to be either the wife, sister, or daughter of the renowned deity Faunus. Faunus' origins lie in Latium, the land of the Latins. Now, what's interesting is, I'm going to show you guys in a second. I don't want to give it away just yet. Her intriguing connection to the deity Faunus provides insight into her attributes and personality, often compared to the mischievous fauns. Fauna embodies the untamed spirits of the field and the forest. Additionally, she is closely associated with Bona Dia, the Roman deity of fertility, healing, and women. Together, they form a captivating narrative of power and reverence in Roman culture. There's something I'm looking for here. Uh, I'm going to try to see if I can find it. If I can, I'm going to just move on because there's something we're going to get to in the next section of this video that I think is very, very, very important when it comes to this bloodline um, that is connected to the fallen. Uh, let's see. Can I find it? I don't see it. Right. There you go again. More rabbits. Now you guys can kind of understand where this all comes from and what paganism really is. You know, so if you learn anything from this video, stop following Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church because they got you embracing deities like this. Okay? Got nothing to do with our Messiah. Okay, I don't see it here. Um, Yeah, I don't see it, so we're gonna just move on. But I wanted to show you something about the Basque people because the Basque people tie in heavily to this study. And after we get done looking at these articles and this information, I am going to teach you about the Basque people because the Basque people of Europe are predominantly of the bloodline of the Nephilim. But I don't want to get too too far ahead of myself. But Faunus is a deity that the Basque people who were pagans worshipped. Okay, let's keep this moving. And as I mentioned before, Ishtar is the um, the deity of love, sexuality, and fertility. Okay. All right. Now, I wanted to show you this because <clears throat> what's really, really interesting is when you read about Shire, right, or Mount Shire, we know that it was a cave that, as I mentioned many times, Esau and his descendants, as well as the Horites, dwelled in. Okay, these cave cities, right? So what's really interesting is this is Petra right here. And before I get break down Petra, let's just read a little bit of this article just for a little context. I'm gonna show you something very interesting, okay? So it says the cave dwellings of men. Now we're not gonna read the whole article because it looks to be very long and we still have so much more to go through. But it says the stories of men who lived or worked in caves abound in history, mythology, and folklore tales. The youthful imagination is charmed with accounts of robbers' caves, from that of the 40 thieves down to those described in Gil Blas, and those are associated with the robber period of the history of the Mississippi Valley. Mythology furnishes caves of giants. There it goes again. 
those to which heroes have resorted in the homes of supernatural beings or of gnomes like the Nagubulin and the little people. Such stories are su suggested by the obvious fact that a cave may afford a safe and convenient place of refuge when no other is at hand, and their imaginative features are the outcome of the rarity of the remoteness of experience of cave life within historic times, distance, lending enchantment to the view. So it says tribes of cave dwelling men or troglodytes are described by ancient writers as having lived in Egypt, Ethiopia, on the borders of the Red Sea and in the Caucasus Mountains. There's another witness. The Red Sea region was called by the Greeks from this fact, trog troglodyte. Some of the ancient caves in Arabia are still occupied by the Bud uh, Baduians. The caves of the troglodytes near Ayan Ara in Morocco have been visited by Balanza and Sir Joseph Hooker and described by a correspondent of the London Times are situated in a narrow gorge, the cliffs of which rise almost perpendicularly from a deep valley and are cut in a solid rock at a considerable height from the ground. Okay, we're going to keep reading because I want to get to Petra real quick here. This is Petra, okay, and I'm going to show you a more lifelike actual realistic image of it so this is petra now i want you to look at this architecture here because this was a cave a cave city or a cave town that is said to have been um edom okay so let's take a look at an actual image of it this is petra and you can see it's inside of a mountain range okay so a lot of people believe that this is biblical adum or edom okay and you can see this is it right here, right? Cave city, mountain city. Now, when you look at this architecture and you pay very, very close attention to it, look at ancient Greece. Do you see how the structure is very similar? Now we know that Ali Afaz in the book of Yashar or Jasher ended up mixing with Greco Romans. He mixed with Greece and he mixed with Rome and they became one nation to this day. Therefore, a lot of European people are of Esau, right? Because he ended up leaving Mount Shire and going to Europe, to the lands of the north, the lands of Japheth, okay? But you can see that the architecture is very similar to these this cave city, which is Petra, okay? Let's actually look inside Petra and see what it looks like. I'm just curious. You see, that's the inside of it. And I believe that this is a tourist destination you can actually um, check out. I believe it was once possibly Adum or Edom. And now, you know, it's, it's obviously been excavated and turned into a tourist spot. So the average person can just go and look at it. But you can see the architecture is very, very similar to uh, Petra. Okay, you can see the um, these uh, foundations here, you know, and when you look at Greece and Rome, they're very, very similar. But even the White House looks like this. Let's take a look at that. You see that? This is Edom, y'all. He's all over. Esau is all around us. He is all around us. The place that the very president sits is based upon this cave city of Petra, which is said to be the former destination of Edom isn't that very interesting and guess what a lot of your the majority of your presidents including Obama are of the bloodline of the Nephilim this includes the royal family this includes Prince Charles Prince Harry all of them they are all of the bloodline of Hashatan they are of the serpent seed they are descendants of the Nephilim but I've always found that to be very, very interesting how similar all of these landmarks are. Look at that, very interesting. All right, we're gonna keep on moving. All right, so the Yeti of the Caucasus Mountains. Now, as I said, when it comes to Bigfoot, when it comes to Sasquatch, when it comes to the Yeti, it is not a mythical figure. It is a real being that walks amongst us. They've just changed their name, okay? So it says, um, the students of prehistory build their science on a range of discoveries, the most notable of which involves a particularly complete skeleton or bone fragments. In the coming years, are they once going to observe directly a hominoid or hemonoid surviving fossil from prehistory? Um, 
or a wild man of the caucus wild man of the caucus do you see all these this evidence i'm bringing out may be the subject of this remarkable observation different from the yeti of the himalaya which is only a guy guy i don't even know how to pronounce that the almasty of the caucus is a hominid which already possesses certain traits of neanderthal man formerly rather well known to the inhabitants of the region who have numerous recollections of their encounters with these wild men it appears unfortunately to be on the way to extinction we know that that's not the truth russian archaeologists who are trying actively to observe it have not yet succeeded in approaching it this exceptional prospect is going to cause special uh, specialists in evolution to hold their breath over the coming years and perhaps one day will reward amply their weight so it says that these were wild men of the Caucasus Mountains. This is where you get your modern day ish people and many other individuals that come from them and look like them. Okay. Hmm. Very interesting. I'm not going to read this whole article. Let's keep going. All right. So this is an article from the National Human Genome Research Institute. And it says the complete Neanderthal genome sequenced. DNA signatures found in present day Europeans and Asians, but not in Africans. Whew, boy, I don't think I need to say no more than that. Let's keep going. And I think that's all I wanted to show you guys. Um, so with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get back to the video. Oh, there's one more thing, actually. Let me just type this in real quick. The red hair giants. I want to talk about that real quick because it's actually very interesting. So supposedly in Nevada, there were Native Americans or indigenous Americans that came across this giant that had red hair and white skin. Could he possibly be a descendant of the Nephilim? I mean, he looked like them. Let's take a look at it. Okay, right here. Here we go. Found it. And this is actually the website we were on earlier, Ancient Origins finally found it so it says the Pautis, a native american tribe indigenous to parts of nevada like i said it was in nevada having an oral tradition that they told to early white settlers of the area about a race of red-haired white giants or barbarians that their ancestors referred to as the ct ka the story was written down in 1882 by Sarah Winuk uh, Winnemucca Hopkins, daughter of Paiute Indian chief in her book, Life Among the Paiutes, The Wrongs and the Claims. So this person is admitting that they were white with red hair. Huh. Very, very interesting and suspicious just indeed. All right, y'all. So we're going to get back to the video. I feel like I've pulled up enough here. We're going to get back to the video. I got more to show. We're almost done with this study let's keep it going Pow. all right family we're almost done with this study i just have a few more things i want to show you so they have been putting the truth about the so-called wild man in plain sight for quite a while i want you to take a look at some of these um movies that they've released and some of them you might recognize let's just take a look at them real quick let me share my screen so this is the film and the book where the wild things are. And if you look at these characters like this one, for example, you can see the straight hair, the red hair covered in hair. Okay, you can see the horn deity right here. You can see the tail. This one has a scaly body. You can see that these are, they kind of appear to be demons. And you can see that this one is kind of furry. And then you've got this one, this kid right here, who's dressed up like an animal, or he's dressed up like one of these wild things. And I think it's interesting because this used to be one of my favorite books as a child. I never actually saw the movie because by that time I was already grown. But when I was thinking about The Wild Man, this book and this film kind of came to mind. And I just thought that that was very interesting. And this is the um, theatrical rendition of the book. And yeah, I just thought that was very interesting. It just came to mind. And these two right here resemble the wild man more than anything else. And I feel like this one right here is based more on the sats here. It's very interesting. But uh, let's keep look. Let's keep on moving. 
Now this is the film Jumanji, also another one of my favorite childhood movies. And you can see this is Robin Williams and he's dressed like the wild man. He's got the vegetation, he's got the leaves on him. He's got the crazy unkempt look, you know? It's very interesting, guys. It's like they put the truth in plain sight so much. You see him right here, blue eyes. He is depicting the wild man. Let's keep going. Now this is uh, the wild, the wildings from the show, The Game of Thrones. Now I've never actually watched this show, but I remember when I was doing the research on this video, somebody mentioned it. And you can see they, in a sense, can also resemble the wild man. You see this guy right here, he's got like these, what appears to be animal skins. He's got the unkempt look. Yeah, uh, they don't have hairy bodies per se because we can't see what's underneath it. But this also came to mind as I was doing research for this video. You know, here he is again. You can see the crazy beard, the crazy hair. You know, and it's it is very interesting that they normally depict these wild men as Europeans. It's like they're literally telling you the truth to your face. You know, here goes some more of them. Here's a better picture. And these are known as the wildings. Here's another one right here. Look at that shaggy appearance these look like they're somewhat of what you would call like animal skins okay and then of course you have the movie tarzan which is also another one of my favorite childhood movies and you notice that he is very tribal and animal like he crawls on all fours i just thought that was interesting now another thing i want to show you guys is there are actually a people in europe that crawl on all fours. Let me show you that real quick here. As we get closer to me exposing to you the Basque people, um, let's take a look at this real quick. Now, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to hear the audio. Um, I'm recording this in the studio, but I just thought that it was, this was uh, very, very interesting. Let me see if I can find it. Um, hold on, let's see. Let's see here pull this thing up i saw the video recently and i was like wow this is very very interesting like look at this girl right here let me show you this video look at this this is insane like what hold on hold on let's play the video wow little commercials or whatever what the heck Wow. I mean, there's literally videos of this woman jumping over fences like a dog. Okay, hold on. Let me mute the music. I don't want to get a copyright. But look at this, y'all. Do y'all see what I'm seeing? She's literally over here running with the dogs. And it said that the wild men would literally run and frolic with other animals. And we saw some of the depictions of them crawling on all fours like animals. I'm gonna show you another book that depicts them in this way. Look at this. This is literally insane. Wow. Wow. Oh my, oh my, oh my. This is crazy. All right, now there's another video I wanna show you guys where there's like a tribe of people in Europe that crawl on all fours let me see if i can find it that's actually what i was here it is this is what i was looking for it says family that walks on all fours baffles scientists they shouldn't exist look at this y'all these are europeans we're talking about look at this are you starting to see what i'm showing you guys hold on let me uh make this a little bit bigger here with evolutionary psychologists, these people walk on all fours, y'all. This is not made up. You can clearly see this is a real video. Six of the 18 children were found to have been able to walk on all fours on the palm of their hands. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. This is crazy, y'all. Wow. Huh. Boy, oh boy. All right, well, we saw that. Now there's one more thing that I wanna show you guys. We're gonna look at this book here that I have, okay? This book is called 
The Wild Men, Medieval Myth and Symbolism. And this is by Timothy Husband with the assistance of Gloria Gilmore House. Okay, and this is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art of New York. All right, so we're gonna just kind of skim through some of these pictures. We're not gonna read everything. I'll read the introduction just so we can kind of have an idea of what we're dealing with here. And we'll look at some of the images depicted in here and you're gonna see some of these wild men. Here's one of the depictions right here. You can see the hairy body, you know, this is obviously an artist depiction of the wild man. But now let's read this introduction because I think the introduction is very telling. Okay, so let's take a look at what it says. It says, toward the end of the Middle Ages, all aspects of life had become so steeped in an atmosphere of deep religiosity that no object or incident, no idea or action could escape religious interpretation. A state of tension grew as J. Huazinga observed in which all that is meant to stimulate spiritual consciousness is reduced to appalling commonplace profanity to a startling worldliness in otherworldly guise. Concepts generated by faith tended to be seized upon and externalized in a naive and literal fashion, and thus abstractions became rendered as concrete realities. Kadash or holy and profane thought were constantly intermingled. The ordinary was transmuted to the sacred and the sacred to the commonplace with such consistency that any real distinction between religious and secular thought virtually disappeared. Nothing could better demonstrate this phenomenon other than the myth of the medieval wild man. The wild man is a purely mythic creature, or so they say, was a literary and artistic invention of the medieval imagination. In physical appearance, he differed from man, mainly thick in his thick coat of hair, which left only his face, hands, feet, and with wild women, their bare breasts. Elbows and knees were often exposed as though hair could not grow on these areas of flex and wear. The hair was long and tufted at times, well-groomed, and at other times filthy and matted with dirt, moss, and other accretions. A variant form of the wild man, well illustrated in 15th century engravings, shows him covered with a thick growth of leafy foliage, just like we looked at. We looked at um, the many images of in the tapestry. We looked at uh, the depictions of him in movies. He's covered in leaves. He's covered in vegetation, right? Rather than hair, which was generally thought to be black, it says... Renaud de Montauban describes social outcasts personified by wild men, black and hairy like a chained bear. There, there's, the, there's the hairy body again. All right, let's just look at some of these images. So it says this right here. It says the capture of a wild man photograph of a scene from Wild Manji performed at Balt Schneider, Switzerland, 1976. And this is just a guy in a costume. Okay. We've got another one here. Now, this is depicting the wild man on all fours, just like we looked at in those two videos. You had the girl that was running around like an animal, and then you had the family of people that were literally all walking on all fours, which is very, very interesting. You can see the hairy body, and you can see the hands are exposed. And when you really look at this, this looks like what you would call a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. But the only difference is they're not walking upright, but they're walking on all fours fours very very interesting all right let's keep on going here you have a sasquatch or sasquatch i was about to say sasquatch you have a wild man over here being um attacked or accosted by hunter dogs or dogs that are obviously trained because you can see the collars you can see that they're all attacking the wild man it says wild man at bay detail of manuscript illumination from the psalter of queen mary of england and i told you that the royal family is connected to the fallen bloodline and we're going to get a little bit more into that as we ex as we understand and expose the basque people okay but it says this was made in 1325 london the british library of royal miss 2b7 so the British Library, this is what I'm saying. There's so many things that the royal family and many people connected to them are covering up. This is stuff that they've known. This is stuff that they're aware of. And they're not putting it out there because they don't want you to know who they are and what they are. Let's keep going. It says a wild man playing a Rebecca or Orpheus, a wooden bread mold, Switzerland, 16th century. Wow. Mm. Crazy. 
And you know, you always see oftentimes that when you look at them, they are depicted next to elks and, and goats and horned animals, which is very interesting indeed. All right, right here, you've got jam figures in the form of wild men, detailed right jam of main portal of the College of San Gregorio, Spain. Now, Spain is very important to also understand in this because as we get into our the, the last chapter of this study, as I said, we're gonna be talking about the Basque people and they play a very important role in the next chapter of this video. So you wanna stick around as we come to a conclusion of this video and we talk about this fallen bloodline, okay? Now, this right here is supposed to be Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you know scripture, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon or Babal, okay? When the Yaudim were taken into captivity and he was shown a dream, Daniel, or who you call Daniel, interpreted the dream and he told him that Yahuwah showed him a dream or the dream was that he would lose his kingdom. He was cast out of Babylon and he became a wild man. He became hairy, he became tribal, he became animalistic. And this image right here is a depiction of Nebuchadnezzar when he entered into this state, this mindset of a wild man. Now keep in mind, he was a king at one point, but when he lost his kingdom, he kind of lost his mind and he became feral. And this is a depiction of that. Right here, you've got another depiction of a wild man, you know, crawling on all fours like the animals that he's around. It says, Nebuchadnezzar cast out amongst the beast manuscript illumination from the Bible of King Sancho El Fuerte of Spain. There's go Spain again. Keep that in mind as we move on to the next chapter of this. All right, you got stained glass windows with wild men depicted at the bottom and you can see the club right there. You can see the hairy body. It says the divine order from wild men to knights to angels stained glass Roundel with the arms of Glarus. This is in Switzerland, about 1500. Look at that. Wow. You got another image here of a wild man. And you can see the children. It says wild folk family engraving by Master BX in Germany. So you can see a lot of these concepts come from Europe. Let's keep going. Here's another wild man. It looks like he's blowing out smoke, something of the sort. And here he's depicted with a tail, which is very interesting because from most of the images we've looked at and most of the research we've done, we have not seen them depicted with tails. But it's it's very fitting. I mean, if we understand that um, Shair uh, connects to he goat, right? It would make sense that they would have a tail. I don't know if it would look like this. That almost looks like a rat tail to me. It says the Pope as a wild man, huh? Interesting. So this is supposed to be the Pope engraving by Melchior Lors with text of Martin Luther from Germany after 15, 1545 Berlin. Wow. So this is supposed to be the Pope, huh? Interesting. All right, let's keep on looking at these images. Uh, I have no idea what that is. Let's scroll down a little bit more. All right, we got some color images here. All right, you've got a wild man that seems to be a, a giant that is feasting on this man or this woman, a cannibalistic giant. Now, remember we talked about the Nephilim. We talked about how they feasted on man's flesh and drank the blood. And we can see right here that this is clearly what's happening. And you can see the hairy body. You can see the pale skin. Very, very interesting. And you can tell this is a giant even without reading the text because look how big this thing is compared to this man, or I'm assuming this is actually a woman. It's feasting on the flesh like we read in the book of Kanuk and Genesis 6 or Barashif 6. And here you've got wild men like this hairy being right here and they're amongst dragons. And this looks like a, um, I guess you would consider this a cockatrice, which are also mentioned in scripture. You know, and like I said, you got to understand that during the antediluvian period, you know, there were hybrids that weren't supposed to be here. Here's another wild man. You can see the club. Now, look at these things right here. I've seen these depicted before in um, certain texts, and I'm wondering if this could also be a descendant of the race of the Nephilim right here, because we already know that they were genetically mixing, right? So 
I, I've seen these before. I'm probably gonna have to do a further study on these things because I've I've seen them mentioned before, and I think that could be a good study. So we might have to look at that. Here's another depiction of wild men fighting against these soldiers. But what's interesting here is um, this one has a club, but these this one has a sword this one has a spear this one has a sword and they have these boars that are with them and this looks like a witch in the background i mean we know they were pagans it says alexander in combat with wild men and beasts so i'm assuming that this is king alexander very interesting all right we looked at this tapestry before so we're gonna just get past that but there's another one we didn't see uh i believe this is it right here you can see this wild man fighting a lion and this other one fighting a unit or i guess he's attempting to rip off the horn of the unicorn and you can you know obviously you see the um <clears throat> the crown of of um uh you know what i'm talking about the little crown that goes around their head that we've been looking at all this time the vegetation that we see in grecian culture you can see the vegetation on his body you see the shaggy hair Here's another image of a wild woman, and you can see the shaggy hair, the long hair, you know, and you can also see this that we've seen in so many depictions. So my question is, why is it if this is not true? Why do we oftentimes see these same depictions with the olive, the olive branch around the head, the shaggy hair and the unkempt appearance? And why are they oftentimes around unicorns and lions and goats? Wild woman with unicorn. It says two wild men and their pair of lovers. You can see a wild man right here. And then you got another one right here. Hmm. Okay, uh, it says that this is supposed to be Mary Magdalene and you can see she has a hairy body and this angel or this Malak right here also has a hairy body fallen. It's another one right here, hairy body all over except the face. And right here you've got a wild man with um, a horse riding on a horse and you got these two right here with a sickle working in the field wild folk work in the land detail number 31 here's another depiction of a wild man i'm assuming this is europe you got a castle right here we already looked at the tapestry and we could see that they were attacking the castle and you can see the hairy body in certain parts there's no hair right and you've got a wild woman here with a child There's some more wild men here. Got some more down here. More wild men. Got one here on the bottom. There's one. Wow. There's another depiction of wild men. But like I said, notice how they are mostly white-skinned individuals you have not yet seen a wild man in this whole study that is of darker skin that is not a coincidence this is there's a reason why this this folklore or this so-called what they call folklore or what they call a myth is only prevalent in europe but yet they're doing whole rituals you know it's very very interesting but anyway, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next chapter of this study, which will be the final chapter. And we will wrap this up by talking about the Basque people and the bloodline, the actual bloodline of the fallen. So let's go ahead and let's jump in and let's get into it. I'm really overwhelmed with the decision of whether or not I should take the Rogam shot. I'm RH negative and my partner has a blood donation appointment tomorrow to find out his blood type. And I'm 27 weeks pregnant and just moved. And apparently like there's 
some rule or something where a lot of people or doctors don't like taking pregnant women after 23, 24 weeks. So it's like harder to find an OB. So if I do want to take the shot, like there's a rush on it. I don't know, I'm just reading stories of women who were sensitized and then had sick babies, they had to get blood transfusions. My grandma had multiple losses and almost lost my uncle and he had to get blood transfusions and it's just a really hard decision because there's also risks with taking the Rogam shot, like there's risks with everything. And I just, I'm just really overwhelmed because it's like, I was reading that so there's some women who got the rogam shot and they still were sensitized so it's not even 100 percent preventative i think more than anything i'm scared of being sensitized in general there's women who were silently sensitized who who gave birth non-traumatically there's a vaginal delay cord cutting everything and they were still sensitized like they don't know how I'm just a mess right now. If you are RH negative and your partner is positive, can you tell me your story? And if you have been sensitized and had a pregnancy through sensitization, can you tell me your story? Because I'm trying to weigh my options right now and <clears throat> it's not an easy decision. It's not. Treat against my brother Jacob. The Bible says that we were actually running and ruling over Esau, but it said he, he gained dominion and he got up above us. And then he conquered all, he goes throughout the earth conquering, trying, looking for all of the children of Israel and also the descendants. I'll show you that, that's in Revelation, I'll show you. He's, he's making war against all of the descendants of God. Why? Because he knows God is coming to destroy his kingdom, which the, who, what's his kingdom? The earth now. He done built his whole kingdom in the whole world. Is this too much? So now, now I'm going to give you one more point and then I'll give, go to the rabbit. That's why I wrote that, because I don't want to forget that rabbit. Now, remember I told you about the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are other books of the Bible that was taken out by Esau, the Edomites. They took them out because it describes them. That's why they took them out. The Roman Catholic Church Bible just happened to leave them in. They didn't care if they left them in because they wrote the Bible in Latin where they people couldn't read it anyway. So they didn't care. But the Protestants, the Protestants was the one that took out, that took the book, these out of the Protestant Bible. The Protestants did it. I wonder why they did that. Because they, they said it didn't have any inspired writing. So we took them out. But you know, Esther, the book of Esther is actually longer. They cut the book. Of, why did they, why did they take the end of the book of Esther out? Then you start reading the book, you realize, oh, because it's describing Agite, Hammond, oh, Hammond was an Amalekite. An Amalekite is a descendant of the wife of Esau, but she, she was a Horite. And we know Horites had fallen angel blood. So let's take it out. See, that's why they took this stuff like that. Why? Well, so you wouldn't know that they're, who they are in their bloodline. I told you they mixed with the fallen angel seed. Now, now, I, did I say I'm a teacher? Yes. It's just about being taught. Amen. Now, um, I, t I told you all Wednesday about the blood type called RH negative. And that RH stands for rhesus monkey what it stands for. Now, without getting very technical, it's, it's a lot of technicality to understand this, but I'll try to break it down the best I can. There are people who have RH negative blood. It just so happens to be that, that maybe like 
or between one and four percent of black people have this negative blood. So it's really not something that black people have. But 60% of white people have RA's negative blood. They don't talk about that. They don't tell you this stuff. Now, what this means, that when it, when it, what this means is, is that their blood cannot make a certain antigen called antigen D. And what that means is normal people, normal blood, you know, A, A, B, O, you know, normal blood, they have, they, they, they make this antigen. You got what I'm saying? Now, in order to isolate this, they found out that people with always negative blood, mainly white folk, can produce, they can produce a rabbit gene. See, if I had my PowerPoint, I would, I, I have it, I'll show you what I, the whole graph of it. Scientists was baffled by how these people, now, now nobody else can do that, no non-whites can do it, it's only whites that can produce this, this rabbit gene. You got what I'm saying? And they were saying that they don't know how they were doing it until they went to this place of the Basque people, which is between France and Spain. When they went there, they found out that's the highest concentration of people with RH negative blood, which is all white folk. So what happened was they found out that because those pagan societies worship rabbits for fertility, Got y'all interested though. They actually have a mutation. When they get pregnant, they have to get certain shots and stuff because that's that, that gene is in their body. If they make with somebody else got it, the child will usually die. So white people are mutated. Their blood is not like everybody else's. They didn't teach us that in school. And so, y'all, y'all, y'all done, y'all done, y'all done. Just look it up. Go look it up. Don't, don't, just look it up. Just look up what I said and you will see what I'm saying is the truth. And so this is where they remember they were up in those caves for hundreds and hundreds of years. But those cold regions is the clefts of the rocks. The mountainous areas is where Esau likes to live because remember he lived in Mount Seir. So his people loves those mountains, those mountainous places. One of the reasons is based on protection because of the sun. They, had, they were cave dwellers because they couldn't be out in the sun. Secondly, it's because that's their nature. That cold was their nature and they love to be up in the, in the mountains. Right now, you never see a black man walk to a mountain and climb it. We don't fool with that. But white people got to climb mountain. They got to conquer that mountain. It's they, you know the mountain killing them. You know that mountain over well, over in Tibet that kills people every year. People die. We still got to climb it. We, I'm gonna make it to the top. And for what? Just to say you did it. But they, but they mountain people. They got to conquer the mountain. They dwell in the clefts of the rocks. Even right now they're building cities in the mountains. Think they're gonna escape the judgment of God? They the mountain people, whose habitation is where high. He says in his heart, "Who gonna bring me down?" Now these now, now remember. Um, Europe was not white. Europe was started black. It's, it's proven. The Moors was there first. You can prove it. Let's go look it up. Europe was black. But when Esau, which was up in the mountains, came down out in mountains, I told y'all, uh, if you look at the beginning of Gladiator, when Gladiator was fighting those barbarians, those, that's, 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 that's what they are, the Goths, the Visigoths, that's their people walking around with them big old bird skins on and that's them. They lived up in the mountains, very unsanitary. They came down from those mountains and started conquering all of the civilized world, which was black at that time. And I'll tell y'all how they got white. That's a whole nother teaching. But they came there and started conquering Europe and then when they conquered Europe, of course, anytime you get conquered, you, you, you erase 
all the history of the previous people and only write your history. And even if they got heroes, you change them to your people. If they got any good, any good things, they inventions, you take them and say you did it. So that's what Esau did. And so that's how Europe became white. It was not white at first. And we know now through DNA evidence that those, uh, the, the, the original uh, people of Europe was not white people. They don't want to tell y'all that. But they told you that, that that European man, that Neanderthal man was a European. And that's where he was found at, up in one of them caves. Okay, this one's for all my woke buddies, my people that actually, you know, look into the Bible and research stuff. I have a question, okay? So, our blood, our DNA. I don't know if you guys have heard about something called RH negative. Well, every human being has a rhesus factor in their blood, or they don't. And if you don't, you're considered RH negative. I am one of those people. A lot of your celebrities, politicians, famous, rich people also have RH negative blood. So here's my question. The Bible talks about the fallen angels coming down and having sex with women human women and they created a being of creatures called nephilim right well the thing about rh negative blood is that i've had three children natural okay and with rh negative blood you have to get two shots during your pregnancy one during the fourth month and the other one right after you give birth and it's a shot called rogam okay and they give you this shot because if you're rh negative blood and your baby has positive blood your body will literally kill your infant child in your womb. Now, I've thought about this for years. My daughter is now 16 years old, okay? So, years. And I've just wondered, like, why would God create a human being that has a blood type that would kill his creation, right? And the only logical conclusion I've come to is that it's not of him. It's not his blood type. It's not natural. It's not natural. Doesn't seem natural. So my question, y'all guys out there that, you know, you've looked into the same materials and the same matters. And I mean, they even talk about RH negative blood on ancient aliens, right? Now, I don't believe I'm an ancient alien, <laughs> but I'm saying, what if the RH negative factor is a product of the Nephilim? Just wondering. So please leave your answers or your advice or your opinions in the comments because this is a topic that really interests me and I don't think it gets enough attention. It's weird. Let me know. All right, y'all. So we're almost done with this video. I just have a few more sources that I want to show you guys when it comes to understanding these Basque people as well as this ancient fallen bloodline, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to take a look at some more resources that I think are very, very interesting. So let me just pull my screen up here. All right. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at these Basque people. OK, because there's some very interesting information that comes forth from this. So it says the Basques or the Vascos or the Basque are a southwestern European ethnic group characterized by the Basque language, a common culture and shared genetic ancestry to the ancient Vascons. Now, I just happened to type that in, the word Vascons, and look what comes up. Hairy men, wild men, hairy people, people covered in hair. Huh. Do you see how this is all coming together? Let's keep going. Basque are indigenous to and primarily inhabit an area traditionally known as the Basque Country, a region that is located near the western end of the Pyrenees of the coast of the Bay of Biscay and straddles part of the north central Spain in southwestern France. It says the English word Basque may be pronounced Basque and derives from the French Basque itself derived from the Gascon Basco. Now, if you look up this word, you will also find images of wild men. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get sidetracked here. Um, they cognate with Spanish Vasco. Those in turn come from Latin pronounced. The Latin generally evolved into the Balabials in Gascon and Spanish 
probably under the influence of Basque and the related Aquintian, okay? Instead involved into the French and Romance languages, okay? So these are actually some coins uh, depicting these Basque people here. Um, which were used during the Roman period. And when you really do the research, you can see how these individuals connect not just to Western Europe and the Caucasus Mountains, but also Rome and Greece. So you start to see how deep this rabbit hole really goes when it comes to understanding these people. Um, all right, we're going to keep on moving. I don't want to read all this. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a summary. Let's keep it going. Now, here is a Google image of Basque people, um, and we're going to read this article next, and it says how the Neanderthals became the Basque, and we're going to get to that in a second, but I just want to show you what Basque people look like here, and this is like a, you know, um, different images of the Basque people, and you can see they all are, you know, European-looking people. <clears throat> now, I want to say that there are some people that do have this bloodline that are dark-skinned or melanated. OK, I want to make that clear. But it is as we looked at Pastor Darby and he was talking about the Basque people in this this fallen angel bloodline. He said that there's a very small percentage of so-called people of black skin that have this. It is way more prevalent in European Spanish people. OK, so just keep that in mind as we continue. And you're going to see a lot of evidence for that as we move forward in this study. But. These are all just different Basque people. So they have their own culture, their own language, and they dwell in parts of Europe, such as France and Spain. And they are kind of, you know, different from everybody else. We know why, because of the bloodline, but they look like your modern day Europeans. You would not even know that they have an RH negative bloodline, but they have certain characteristics and features that are very unique to European people. And I'm gonna show you that in just a second. So. Let's continue on. We're going to take a look at this article here because I thought that this presented some very good uh, facts. All right. So it says how the Neanderthals became the Basques from a combination of old and new evidence. It appears that at last we have a satisfactory answer to the age old question. What happened to the Neanderthals? If the current reasoning is correct, their descendants are still with us and we call them Basques. Huh? Interesting. This theory, therefore, simultaneously answers the second old question, what is the origin of the bass? Because when you try to look at the origin of the bass people, you will not really find a lot of information. And I believe that that is on purpose. There are people who are hiding. There are people who don't want you to understand their origins. There are people who are hiding where they come from and what they truly are. And so it makes sense why you can't really find that kind of information. But I'm going to bring forward more facts to prove this. Um, Robert J. Sawyer has recently published his book, Hominids, a fictional account of an interaction between sapien humans and Neanderthals, but drawing on the latest scientific research about Neanderthals. This research includes studies of DNA extracted from bones of Neanderthal remains. The account mentions five months of painstaking work to extract a 379 nucleotide fragment from the country, the control region of the Neanderthal's mitochondrial DNA followed by use of polyamorous chain reaction to reproduce millions of copies of the recovered DNA. This was carefully sequenced and then a check made of the corresponding mitochondrial DNA from 1600 modern humans, native Canadians, Polynesians, Australians, Africans, Asians, and Europeans. Every one of those 1600 people had at least 371 nucleotides and out of those 379 the same, the maximum deviation was just eight nucleotides. But the Neanderthal, the Neanderthal DNA had an average of only 352 nucleotides in common with the modern specimens. It deviated by 70, 27 nucleotides. It was concluded that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals must have diverged from each other between 550,000 and 690,000 years ago. We know that's capped. The Earth is not that old. Um, for their DNA to be so different. See, they try to put a large gap between these findings and when these people existed. It was not that long ago. It really wasn't. It, I'd, I'd say just a couple thousand years, if anything. Okay. In contrast, all modern humans probably shared a common ancestor in the past. It was concluded that Neanderthals are probably a fully separate species from modern humans and not just a subspecies. 
Looking now at the evidence for the theory that the Das are descended principally from Neanderthals, everything suddenly falls into place and the supposition becomes self-evident. Location. The home country of the Neanderthals is well known to have been Eastern Europe. One source says that they dominated this area for at least a quarter of a million years. Yeah, cap. <laughs> Many of these best Neanderthal specimens have originated from Iberian Peninsula, the Basque country lying on the western side of the Pyrenees and the border between Spain and France fits in neatly with this location. Now, if you know anything about the Portuguese and Spanish Yaudim or the Portuguese Spanish Jews, you know that a lot of them were ended up in the land of Spain and Portuguese, and they were <clears throat> brought uh, forced to convert to Christianity by the Romans at the time, and those that were, you know, kind of over that land. And I did just find it very interesting because they were forced to pay a tax to be able to dwell there and eventually they were kicked out in 1492 and then they ended up fleeing to west africa to negro land and then you know or what they call the kingdom of judah and then they were taken into the slave trade so i just find it very very interesting that there's it's very likely that they were amongst these wild men and these basque people you know we already know about the moors the moors were there prior to the basque people but around that time i would imagine that the wild men ended up becoming prevalent more in that area and overtaking the Moorish people. And later on, they became, they came into power and dominance, right? And if you look at, you know, if you look at the history of their religion and stuff like that, a lot of them are pagans, but a lot of Basque people are Christians as well. This is where you get the society of Jesus. This is where you get these, the Roman Catholic church, the paganism, the, the Protestants, you get all of these like connections to these people, which is very, very interesting. So I'm assuming that this is the area where they mostly dwelt. And I'm, I believe that this is uh, Western Europe that we're looking at right here. Let's keep going. It says the bass are well known to have distinctive body characteristics. Karlansky says that ample evidence exists that bass are a physically distinct group. There is a bass type with a long, straight nose, eyes, thick eyebrows, strong tan, and long earlobes. Bass skulls tend to be built on a different pattern. In the early 1880s, a researcher reported someone gave me a bass body, and I dissected it, and I assert that the head was not built like that of other men. And I'm going to show you this real quickly here. It's like that side by side comparison and you can see how similar the modern human female is to the Neanderthal. I mean, the nose is the same. The lip is almost the same. You can see the top lip. There's barely anything there. You know what I'm saying? Most white people are known not really to have lips. I've been teased all my life about my Negroid features, my nappy hair, my big lips. But I mean, if you look at this, they look very similar. They don't have any lips. Look at the nose. Look at the eyes. It's very, very similar. The skull structure is exactly the same. And if you've done your research on, um, you know, the Abarim or the Hebrews, um, they eat, we even had a different skull structure than the ancient Egyptians or the Hamites. We were a completely different people from some of the indigenous African tribes that dwelt in those lands. So the deeper you dig and the deeper you research, you start to understand a lot of things that have been brought forward are really, really proving how much we've been lied to about literally everything. But let's keep going. As well as these published articles, I have received many messages from people with vast family origins who have recognized themselves or their relatives in the characteristics suggested in a 2002 article. One lady said that the National Geographic reconstruction could have been a photograph of her mother. Wow. One interesting facet of Neanderthals not picked up in this 2002 article is that they are believed to have reddish hair and light skin, reddish hair and light skin. And as I move forward in this study, I'm going to show you guys that reddish hair and white skin is one of the main characteristics you will find in Basque people. Like I said, the, the Nephilim bloodline, there are some black people that have it. And the reason why they would is because of mixing, you know, and, um, you know, mixing with certain individuals that have this. But the thing is, this is why the Most High told us not to mix with other nations, other strangers, because, you know, you don't know what you're mixing with. And if you just, just so happen to mess around with these folk, you could really be putting your child's life in danger because they have 
uh, this antigen in their body that makes their body reject the child. And their body has been um, genetically mutated to delete the child while it's in the womb. And if they don't get the Rogam shot, that's exactly what will happen to the child. I mean, this is this is an abomination. It, it just is. Let's keep going. <clears throat> the old concepts of Neander Neanderthals being brutish, primitive people have recid receded in the light of modern studies. Instead, with their powerful, tough physique and brain size above the modern average, increasing evidence of cultural and artistic achievement, we may all be quite proud of the Neanderthal inheritance. <laughs> That's funny. But I mean, and, and it would make sense also, because if you think about it, a lot of these people from this fallen bloodline are in power. And I'm going to show you that a little bit later. A lot of your celebrities, all of your presidents, except maybe one, are all connected to this bloodline. When you think about the 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati, every single one of them are RH negative. It's a very protected bloodline. You talk about the Rothschilds. You talk about the Kissingers. You talk about the Bilderbergs. You talk about all these people that are in this power, that are in power, the royal family. All of them come from the fallen bloodline, including Obama. So let's just keep going because there's more I want to show you. All right. All right. So we're going to pull some articles from this uh, this article here, and it's called rhesusnegative.net. So this is like a website that does a little bit more in-depth research when it comes to understanding you know, RH negative blood. And we're going to just take a look at some of these articles here that I pulled up from this website to prove some stuff. It says 100 traits that RH negatives might have in common. Now, pay attention to this because there might be some people in your life that have these traits and they may not come out and fully tell you that they are an RH negative. They may not even know that they are. But if they're a woman and they've been pregnant before, they had to get this Rogaine shot because if they don't or I'm sorry, I said Rogaine, Rogam shot, because if they don't, the baby could possibly end up deleted. OK, so let's look at this. It says RH negatives are not likely to just believe someone or something based on words. The vibe has to be right. Intuition has to give us green light. Now, one more thing I want to say before I continue reading this is that RH negative people tend to have highly um, sensible sensible characteristics meaning that they don't like loud noises they don't like loud crowds a lot of them are into the occult a lot of them say that they were born with abilities to see spirits a lot of them were born with the ability to read minds to astral project a lot of them talk about they've had you know ufo abduction experiences they have these highly psychic abilities born into them why because they come from a bloodline of you know spiritual beings that we're not supposed to mix with humans so just keep that in mind if someone says i was born with my third eye open using you know cultic theology and stuff like that you got to be careful because they are there's a good chance that they are rh negative and it's not just women it's men too uh so i don't want to read through all of these um we can't just settle what pains us, be it jobs, relationships, or live in the wrong place. Our senses are heightened. There's a one another one another one of those abilities that they have are heightened senses. All right, let's keep going. Um, sometimes we feel great about being different. Other times it's a burden. When arguments around us are heated, we tend to step away knowing our energy is far too precious and created for greater things. Once again, highly sensitive can't stand loud noises can't watch certain films they are very very sensitive people uh let's see what else we got here claire cognizant might be a word that applies to us so they are clairvoyant they have clairvoyant like abilities you know they have the ability to be able to see into the spiritual world right a lot of people that are not rh negative they end up gaining this ability by stimulating their chakras and so on and so forth and if you know me you know i don't believe in that stuff i don't believe in chakras i don't believe in stimulating them i believe in the most high and the most high only and his son i don't believe in the new age and all this satanic stuff that they're getting you to do opening yourself up to shadim or what we call demons I'm not interested in none of that stuff, but these people are born with these abilities in them already because of this fallen bloodline that they come from. Let's keep going. 
Telepathy is an ability we tend to have as energy is not picked up by us. It keeps moving in us into directions, revealing other people's plans and intentions among other drives, therefore giving us some kind of idea as to where someone is headed. So they have telepathic abilities. That's very interesting. Most people will tell you in these so-called alien abductions, which is really the fallen, which is really, you know, the Anunnaki and all that, 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 that they're experiencing. They're dealing with demons or fallen angels um, because you remember um, Hashitan deceived a third of the angels. You know what I'm saying? So that was 200 something angels. Not all of them are locked up in Tartarus right now. And the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim are roaming the earth to this very day. And we also know, and all of this is in the book of Kanuk or Enoch, you know, that I'll probably have to get into some other time, but let's keep going. People are often jealous of us. RH negative men are never threatened by strong women. Huh. Interesting. RH negatives do not believe we come from aliens. Rather, it is, an, it is a need to feel recognized for what is special in us and that we were never able to define. Of course, you can't define it. Of course, you can't define it because there's a bloodline in you that comes from beings that are not of this world. Now, obviously, they're not aliens. They are fallen ones. But a lot of these RH negative people may not be reading the Bible and the book of Kanuk. And that this is what I'm saying. This is why they removed Enoch. They removed Enoch because it exposes a lot of things. It exposes a fallen bloodline. It exposes a people that are descendants of the fallen angels and that they're still here to this very day. Many of us have autoimmune issues. We tend to carry some resistance to viral infections. We don't argue religion and politics. We speak freely about us. We are research oriented and willing to learn, but cannot be around those who want to speak it without any willingness to learn. We are bigger than that. So do you see how these people exalt themselves to such a high degree? They think that they're above everybody. I mean, that could really coincide with the colonist mindset when it comes to European people and just how they feel like they're above everybody. This 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 could literally be the origin of white supremacy and where it comes from, sour cream supremacy. Because if you really think about it, they when you think about like the um the uh NAZI people during World War Two, they thought of themselves in this way. And I even venture to say that a lot of them were Basque people. We know that it was in Germany. We know this. The blue eye, the blonde hair, this is all a trait of the fallen. And we're going to keep reading because we're going to see more of that. Let's keep going. We fear losing ourselves. Many of us have experienced synch uh, synchronicities so extreme and intense that we rarely speak about them and only when we naturally feel connected usually to another RH negative. So if a person is RH negative, they are most likely not going to be able to connect with people outside of being RH negative because it's a spiritual thing. Um, let's see. We hate loud sounds. That's another one I told you, you know, that's that that one tells you a lot. When you think of like, uh, I remember I watched that Spider-Man film, Spider-Man three, and you remember the symbiote or venom was the symbiote was affected by loud noises. That was one of the ways to destroy it. There's another show um, that I watched called Invincible and the Viltrumites um, were like these like superhuman alien beings with like these superpowers, great strength and all that. And it took, it, it took a lot to kill them. But one of their weaknesses was loud noises. Like I said, they put a lot of truth out there in these films and these movies and these shows. Let's keep going. We can be very uneasy in crowds. So it's very, very likely that people with RH negative uh, blood are tend to be very reserved and very to themselves. They, they, they tend to be loners or they tend to be in very small circles. They don't like going places where there's a lot of people. They're very socially awkward for the most part. Not confrontational and not afraid of confrontations. And we are often afraid our children are going to be brainwashed someday. So there's some sort of paranoia that comes with this. And also, people who are RH negative are also empaths. Empaths. So when you see people going around talking about I'm an empath, I'm an empath, I'm an empath, you need to be careful. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a sense of empathy, right? But these individuals are overly empathic. 
overly empathic. And you need to be careful about that. All right. We're going to continue on because we got a lot more to get through. What was this? Do RH negative people have a certain look? So now we're going to be getting into the physical characteristics of these folks. All right. I'm not going to play the video because it has copyright music and I don't want to get hit with a copyright. So I'm going to just avoid playing the video. But we're going to read this article here. Okay, it says a tendency, uh, physical characteristics of RH negative people. A tendency to have piercing eyes, often green or hazel. This could easily come from the original tribe that was 100% RH negative, and this tribe might or might not have had still blue eyes. So we're talking about hazel eyes, we're talking about green eyes, we're talking about blue eyes. What people you know on this earth have blue eyes, hazel eyes, green eyes? Now, I'm not saying that they're not dark-skinned people that have hazel eyes, green eyes, blue eyes, but it's very rare that we do. That is mostly found in European people. Now, we were told that that makes a certain individual superior because of these traits, but we're now starting to understand it was really a genetic mutation. And again, we have been told that we are the sons of ham, we're cursed, we're this, we're that, we're cursed with black skin. All I'm doing is setting the record straight. All I'm doing is destroying the lives of Esau, destroying the lives of the oppressor, destroying the lives of the heathen and bringing the truth forward because we've been lied to about these everything. And these folks are the ones who have pushed the lies. And so we're going to destroy the lies. Let's keep going. These are pictures of O negative Pablo Rodriguez, who is from Basque country. And this is him right here. Red hair. Look at that. Green eyes. Piercing eyes. This is another lady. This is her name is Rebecca Prentice, RH negative or O O negative. This is another child. Look at those eyes. Look at that hair. Look at the skin. Reddish or red hair. Just like blue eyes, red hair is also recessive. And even though most of us do not have red hair, it looks like a huge percentage has a reddish shimmer, also indicating the recessive trait fighting its way to be seen. So you realize that these are recessive traits, but what makes the black man or black woman different from these other individuals is our genes are dominant. Dominant. Why do you think that these folks steal everything we do, copy everything we do? want to be like us so bad, want to be a part of our culture so bad. It's because when you realize what your history is, of course you want to take something that's not yours and say, and claim it to be yours. But our genes are dominant. You know, if you think about the black woman, I mean, she can make a child of any color, any skin tone. A white woman cannot make a black child. There's no way under, this, under the dome that that can be done. We have dominant genes, they have recessive genes, and this is literally them admitting that their genes are recessive. Clearly, we were here long before they were. I'm just saying, let's keep going. Your hair might be brown, black, or blonde, but the reddish shimmer and the recessive trait seems to show up as well. So black, blonde, or reddish hair are another physical characteristic of people with RH negative blood. A large cranium. The awake look is something that struck me from the beginning. The shape of the faces have once suspected me to believe that RH negative people somehow are connected to Neanderthals. There it is again, more evidence. I'm showing y'all different articles, but you can see how all of this information is connecting. Considering their skeleton showing a similar head shape. This theory I have, I have, however, laid to rest when people at the Mac Institute have informed me that the two Neanderthal specimens examined by them turn out to be positives O and positive genotype and RH negative homozygites. But we know that according to what we've already understood from the scriptures and what we've understood about the wild men, they dwelled in caves that cannot be put to rest. I mean, if you look at this lady right here and you look at that forehead, if you look at her from the side, she would look like a Neanderthal, okay? So we can't really put that to rest if you're looking at all the information we've looked at today. We know that these folks come from the Neanderthals. A high forehead. 
This is something I noticed immediately looking through profile pictures where the awake look has obviously been there. Large eyes. Oh man, her eyes are creepy, Ock. Like, her eyes are creepy, bro. Oh, I can't even look at this. It, it, it's kind of making me feel a little bit unsettled. I, I can't even look at this woman's eyes. Freckles, another trait of RH negative people. It says, unlike the above traits, freckles are a dominant trait. So that's a dominant trait. They, we looked at the recessive traits that, that they have, but this is a dominant one. What happens in this case is that you should, is that they show you the res lighter recessive feature, but a few drops of darker genes are coming through, but only in tiny doses. So they might have a little bit more melanin in them, but this is also a trait of RH negative people. Very, very interesting. Let's see what else we got here. Um, this is another RH negative woman, but you can see everything we've been looking at. These are not black people. These are all white people. Now you see this lady right here. She obviously looked like she could be mixed, right? It says, there are many examples. I'm not just talking about looking young. I'm referring to an energy level. We would associate usually with people at a much younger age. This, this lady obviously probably is mixed and she has, you know, some Afrocentric features. You can tell by looking at the hair. Okay. Quite a few RH negative people appear to be left-handed. Okay. Very, very interesting. Is there really something more common uh, amongst RH negative people? I'm not sure about it, but there have been claims that have been made. Web toes is the common name for syndactyly affecting the feet. It's a characteristic by the fusion of two or more digits of the feet. This is normally in many birds such as ducks, amphibians such as frogs, mammals, kangaroos, and humans. It's considered unusual, occurring approximately one in 2,000 to 2,500 live birds. So they have some very strange toes, almost webbed or claw-like in a way. Oof, boy. When you jump down this rabbit hole, man. Let's see what else we got here. Um, wow. All right, we're gonna keep on moving on here. Wow, look at that, red hair, green eyes, hazel eyes. And like I said, you do have some so-called melanated people that have um, this RH gene. But when, we've, when we go through all these people, the majority of them are European looking. All right, we're going to continue on because I have some more stuff that I want to show you guys. So we're going to keep it moving. Let's continue on to the next thing here. All right, so we kind of went through um, some of the RH negative physical, uh, physical traits that they have or characteristics. We talked about the red hair. We talked about the reddish shimmer. We talked about green eyes able to pick up on energies very easily, very uneasy in clouds, very sensitive to most things, can't stand loud noises, have a huge forehead, have big eyes, large cranium, have freckles, very passionate whatever they do and their their interest. We talked about some of the abilities, the psychic abilities they have such as clairvoyancy, um, you know, telepathy, astral projection, and many of these occult practices that they naturally are good at. And see, they, they look at it like it's a badge of honor, but they don't realize that these are the same things that the fallen angels taught to men that is literally in their blood. Let's keep going. All right, it's talking about RH negative personalities. And you know, if you look at this website, you literally see tarot cards. Isn't that very interesting? Very interesting. Okay. All right, I don't think we're gonna read this. I don't think there's really necessary, necessarily a need to. So we'll keep it moving. All right, now this is my Instagram. I did a post about this a while ago, and I just want to show you guys some of the stuff from this um, this study, so or this little post that I did. 
um make sure to follow me on instagram my instagram is yexer malkaya music okay i'm on instagram if you guys want to follow me there so i want to show you some of these things that i pulled up on my instagram Okay, so I'm going to read you what I wrote. It says, RH negative blood is mostly prevalent in European people and not African people, though, because of mixing some blacks can be RH negative. This proves that this bloodline is a genetic mutation and comes from the Neanderthal or the Kurim or Horites. Esau mated with that dwelt in Mount Shire or Sierra. They had fallen angel blood and are descendants of the fallen, as I've already proven in this video. And I want to show you this other thing. This is from a news broadcast where they talked about how a lot of European people descend from Neanderthals. Let's take a look at that. Now for a discovery which may surprise you. Scientists have found that most of us still have a little bit of a Neanderthal inside us. A study into the DNA of the human subspecies found that they interbred with modern humans tens of thousands of years ago and their genetic mark remains today. BBC's Palab Ghosh has more on these extraordinary findings. This is a skull of a modern human and this is from a Neanderthal. Look closely and you can see that this one has a slightly longer brain case. Most scientists believe that these are two separate species and there wasn't much interaction between the two. But now we know there was interbreeding and that all non-Africans living today are part Neanderthal. The researchers extracted DNA from Neanderthal fossils and compared it with that taken from people living today. They found that the DNA of Europeans and Asians is 2% Neanderthal. It's a very exciting discovery because it gives us really the first strong evidence that there was interbreeding with people like the Neanderthals. And it means that modern humans in different parts of the world may have slightly different mixes. Further analysis should give... So you can see what it said. It said non-Africans. This is mostly prevalent in European people and some Asian people. All right, let's keep going. I already showed you guys this in the video about you know, Horite meaning cave dweller, the inhabitants of Mount Shire, and Shire meaning hairy or shaggy, patriarch or the Horites, inhabitants of Edom or Adam, before the citizens of Esau. Werewolf syndrome, medically known as hypertrichosis, is a rare condition characterized by excessive hair growth all over the body. This condition is typically genetic and can be present at birth or develop later in life. It can affect both men and women and can vary in severity. While not harmful, hypertrichosis can have significant social and psychological impacts on affected individuals due to the noticeable and extensive hair growth. Treatment options include hair removal methods like shaving, waxing, or laser therapy, but they may offer only temporary relief. So that's what the Horites would have looked like. As a matter of fact, since we're already there, I'm going to show you some real life examples of people that had this this um, this this um, genetic trait where they had hairy bodies, because I know I've shown you guys tapestry. I've shown you all these different pictures and illustrations. But let's take a look at real people that have this this syndrome, which is called like uh, like like I can't even think of how to pronounce it, lycanthropy or something like. But here, look at this. This man's name is Steven Bybrowski. This is probably most likely what the Horites looked like. And I'm going to show you a scripture where Timna, Timna is the one that brought forth Amalek. Okay, this is one of those Horite women that Esau slept with. And if you go to the scriptures in the book of Jasher or Yashar, she came to Jacob and his sons. And when they saw her, they didn't want nothing to do with her. It's probably very likely she looked like this. And I'm gonna show you that in a second, but let's just take a look at these images. Look at that. These are real people, y'all. These are real people. And I'm gonna show you some more examples. Here's another one. This guy's name is Fedor Je Jeff Tichu. Look at that. Hairy, hairy body, hairy face. So you wanna tell me that Bigfoot and the Sasquatch is just a myth? You wanna just tell me the wild men are a myth? Clearly there are people that are amongst us that have this that descend from those people. It's not a myth. 
this is a uh, another person her name is julia pastrana and you can see she's actually a little more melanated but nonetheless this is what she looked like mm. boy it's creepy stuff now you guys can see that there are people amongst us who are not human this is shaolin grandmaster taijin okay look at that this is a guy named victor dammy danny ramos and this is him right here and he actually has a brother that looks just like him and has hair all over his face all over his body all right this is alice doherty and I'm going to just show you some close-ups here. Look at that. These are real people, y'all. That's her as a baby. Hairy face. Look at that. Whew. Creepy. So we can see that the Horites are a real people that existed on this earth. And there's plenty of history when you do digging of people like this that existed. This is another person. This is Barbara Van Beck. hairy face face covered in hair look at this person now I don't know if this is actually real I think that they just put their hair over their face to look like them for Halloween or something but yeah wow look at that Ugh. man this is making my skin crawl bro I, I'm not gonna even lie this is a person named Priscilla Lothar that's her as a baby. Look at that hair all over the body. Horites. Descendants of the Horites. Descendants of the Nephilim. Descendants of Esau. Bearded. Look at this man. I don't, I don't even think that's hair. I think those are like scales on his body. Now, I'm sure you guys know that a lot of these people were put like through circuses and stuff like that. You know, for their freak shows and stuff. Now, this looks like a mannequin. I don't think this is actually a person. But it's based upon a real person. There's another image. Look at that face. Look at that beard. And that's supposed that is a woman. That is literally a woman. And then lastly, we got Kratos and Pertris Gonsalves. And these are some more images of what they look like. And you can see that this is a gene that's all throughout their family. Look at this. Only person that doesn't have it is the mother. But the father had it and passed it down to the children. Why? Because the man carries the seed. Their lineage comes from the father, according to scripture. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. This is another illustration of this person. Hairy face. So let's get back. Now, many of your celebrities are also RH negative. And we're going to go through some of these lists. And this is the top 100 RH negative celebrities. Now, this is not really talked about very often. And obviously, for obvious reasons, there are people that don't want you to know what they are. But we're going to just go through some of these people and see who we recognize, who we don't recognize. And, you know, you're going to see most of what most of the people that look like are RH negative. All right, this is Neil Armstrong, the great liar that we walked on the moon <laughs> people still believe that that's funny anyway um this is kevin bacon rh negative i have no idea who this is stephanie bachman never heard of her definitely before my time kathy buckley i don't know who she is ted bundy this famous serial deleter or unaliver RH negative, y'all. Tim Burton. James Cameron, famous Hollywood director. RH negative. Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton. And I mentioned this before. All of your presidents are of the fallen bloodline. And you can see many of these celebrities are of it too. This is why it's Edomite run Hollywood. A lot of these folks are descendants of the Horites or the Kurim. Al Capone, RH negative, y'all. Some of these names are probably going to shock you. 
Fidel Castro, R.H. Kurt Cobain, R.H. Bill Collins, he does that song. I wanna know, can you show me something's familiar about them strangers like me? Yeah, multi-instrumentalist, R.H. Negative. Sheryl Crow. Johnny Depp. Leonardo DiCaprio. Do you see why a lot of these people are in power? It's, become, it's because they come from a Nephilim bloodline. This is what they all have in common. So in a way, it's, it sounds like a conspiracy, but a lot of these people are related. And this bloodline is supposed to be a protected bloodline. And that's where you get into the Illuminati bloodlines and all that other stuff. The very protected Illuminati bloodlines, which connects to the Rothschilds, connects to all these different rich, powerful families. You know, the Rockefellers and all of them. David Duchovny. Clint Eastwood. Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Erdogan. I believe he's the uh, prime minister of Turkey. Trump too. Yep. Trump as well. Let's see who else we got here. Anybody else I recognize? Gerald Ford, the 38th president of the United States. RH negative. Not a coincidence. Uh, let's see. Victor Garber. I don't even know who half these people are. Jimi Hendrix. That might shock you. Like I said, there are some people who are melanated that are also RH negative. Let's keep going. Jim Henson, the creator of the Muppets, RH negative. Mick Jagger. Scarlett Johansson. And she's very interesting because I've noticed that there she has been taking these these like African children and taking them in and raising them. But there are some things going on with this woman that are not good. And I can't really talk about it on here because this video would get flagged immediately. But essentially, it has to do with, you know, your things that they've been talking about when it comes to a certain island and a certain people that you know have these activities with children that are very inappropriate and it's been said that what she's doing with these black hebrew children is essentially doing that and she's part of this venture where there's a lot of african children that are going through t r a f f king yeah i'm gonna just leave that there Angelina Jolie, RH negative. So now you're starting to see it's not a coincidence that a lot of these people are given these platforms and able to become, you know, great in Hollywood. They have to be of the bloodline, right? And if you're not of the bloodline, there's a lot of things you're going to have to do to get your get your name out there and to become something because there's clearly people who are in the industry that are not of the bloodline, but you can see your top Hollywood types, Janis Joplin, Eartha Kitt. Ooh. I didn't see that one coming. Let's keep going. Lisa Kudrow or Lisa Kudrow. Chris Kyle. Cindy Lauper. John Lennon. David Letterman. Whoo boy, they being exposed today. Ray Liotta. I don't know who that is. Charles Manson, famous serial killer. Do you notice that when it comes to certain individuals that are mentioned on this list, they are very, very mentally unstable? And this is this goes back to the wild man and their behavior and just how they were just wild. You know what I'm saying? And that's why you see that a lot of these folks have this colonizer mindset where they have to nothing but a history of colonization you know because that's what they do i mean these people you gotta understand these people had no structure at one point and they've risen to power by taking over and overrunning people you know and it's also been said that the um rh negative people and the wild men became the barbarians 
So this is just in their blood. It's more spiritual than you realize. Let's keep going. Bob Marley. Now, I could understand why he would be. A lot of people look at Bob Marley and they think that he is a Yashar Ali or he's an Israelite, but he's not. His father was white. So he most likely got this gene from his dad. His mom was black and his father was white. So by that extension, Bob Marley is not a Yashar Ali. You're a Yashar Ali based on who your father is, right? So I'm not shocked that Bob Marley was also RH negative. John McCain, another politician, R.H. Paul McCartney, Steve McQueen, Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of Queen, R.H. Negative. Marilyn Monroe, you know why they keep on putting up her images everywhere and she was kind of presented as the, the image of perfection when it came to, you know, uh, white women in Hollywood, well, RH negative, child of the fallen. Jim Morrison, I have no idea who he is. Paul Newman, blue eyes, look at that. RH, RH. Jack Nicholson, he's a good actor. I'm not going to take that away from him, also on this list. Richard Nixon, Ozzy Osbourne, up, oh, up, oh, hazel eyes, green eyes. Straight hair. Yep. Robert Pattinson. And I think that's so interesting because I remember he was in the Twilight show or the Twilight movie and he was playing a vampire. And one thing you probably don't know is that the royal family is connected to Vlad the Impaler, who Dracula, who was based on. Vlad the Impaler was a real individual and their bloodline goes back to Vlad the Impaler, who is who Dracula or vampires were based upon. So I find it very interesting. He's R.H. Regis Philbin, R.H. Pope John Paul II. So we can even see the Romans, as I've told you, the pagans are R.H. negative. This is where you get your J.C. This is where you get your law is done away. The most evil people in this world are R.H. negative. I hope this is making you rethink your religion if you're a Christian, because... Oof, boy, let's keep going. Julia Roberts, RH. I don't know who she is. I think that she is a corn star. Carl Sagan, Susan Sarandon, OJ Simpson. Whoo, boy. Britney Spears, Ringo Starr, Tim Tebow, you've got Donald Trump. See, a lot of people worship this man and don't realize that he, especially on the right wing, they worship him, you know, and they don't realize he is a child of the fallen too. He is of this satanic bloodline. Look, you can't you can't become president or rise up into such a position of power unless you are of the bloodline when it comes to presidents. Every single president, they, they fight in front of you, they fight in front of the cameras, but behind closed doors, they're all interconnected, all interrelated, and in all of this satanic bloodline, including this clown. I mean, I don't know how there's anything about this dude you can respect. Everything you see in politics is fake. It's all scripted. They want you to think that he's gonna fix and stop the NWO and stop the, the New World Order. PU, not gonna happen. This is all, he's, call, he's what you call controlled opposition. Let's keep going. Lana Turner, Prince Charles, I told you. RH negative. Look at that, hazel green eyes. Prince William, obviously. Like I said, this bloodline is very, very protected. Queen Elizabeth, that's why they were calling her the, the Lizard Queen. Yeah, Serpent Seed. The Queen or the Mother. All right, we're gonna keep on moving. We went through all these different celebrities, but you can see, and there's many, many others that they didn't mention, but there's so many presidents that you saw, including Obama, including Ronald Reagan, 
and many of your presidents and celebrities that are connected to this. Let's keep going. It's the Rothschilds family, and you can see right here the founders of the Holy Roman Empire, and they were connected to Frankfurt, Germany. Huh, very interesting. Western Europe. That's where we read this is where a lot of these bass people came from and the Neanderthals that dwelt there because they also dwelt in the Caucasus Mountains as well. But Germany, okay, you see how this is all connecting. Let's keep going. Okay, I got to be very careful with this section. Are RH negative people ish? Revelation 2939. I actually have the full article right here because it was moved. It says the answer is yes. And the more I'm looking at genetic history, the more obvious it becomes as previously discovered. It comes to no surprise that on the female side of the ish, 1.7 million people, 20% of the Aj population descend from one single branch, which of course is unique, but no surprise considering being ish is being passed through the mother. And just and just the further back in time we go to the Basque region, Paplo group J become more and more frequent. So that the Hebrew K on the female side. Now, let me make something clear. The bloodline of Yasharal is E1B1A. So if you're seeing something that says J, that is not the bloodline of 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 Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It, it is. It's not. And that's what I'm saying. This is the great lie that they have perpetuated so far. But even these folk who claim to be us are really also from the Caucasus Mountains, covering up a lot of things, and descendants of Esau, the Edomites, and all that. The ancient Basque. Geneticists have quite a great interest in the Basque of far northern Spain because of their unusual language, which suggests they descend from some of the original settlers who arrived in southwestern Western Europe during and after the Ice Age. Though haplogroup K is relatively rare among the bass today, mitochondrial DNA extracted from prehistoric burials suggests it has much more common in past and remains excavated from three centuries between 4K to 5K years ago. Yeah, right. K showed up at level 17 to 24%. A similar sample from a medieval bass cemetery found that by around 1,500 years ago, the haplogroup's levels have fallen to its present day at about 4%. Hmm. Now, let's look at the ish, people. A few branches of haplogroup K, such as K1A, K2A2, and KA1B1, are specific to ish populations, and especially to the Rev29s, the Aj people, okay? whose roots lie in Central Eastern Europe. These branches of haplogroup K are found at levels of 30% among the Ash people but they are also found at lower levels in ish populations from Spain. That indicates an origin of those K haplogroup branches in the Near East before 70 AD. See, they're trying to connect this to these folk, but these folk during 70 AD were in the Caucasus Mountains, but you know, they gotta push the lie, of course. So you gotta be, like I said, when you read these articles, you gotta understand there's a controlled narrative. That's not gonna give you the full truth. So you have to be able to kind of chew up the meat and spit out the bones as I mentioned before. About 1.7, Osh people living today, about 20% of the population, probably more, share a single branch of the K haplogroup. The diversity of the haplogroup among the Osh people suggests that it arose in their Near East between 2,000 and 3,000 years ago. Everyone who shares it today could have shared a common ancestor as recently as 700 years ago. A similar pattern in the other two K branches that are common among the Osh people, K1A9 and K2A2, as well as the N1B branch of the haplogroup N, has led researchers to conclude that 40% of the Osh people living today, about 3.4 million people, could descend from them as four women who lived within the past 2,000 years. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Well, there it is. You know that these folk are wild men. They descend from them. They are RH negative, descendant of the Nephilim. I mean, the red hair, the green eyes, the hazel eyes. What more do I need to tell you? All right, and I think that's all. Oh, one more thing. Let's go to the scripture. So this is the book of Jasher. And uh, I believe this is uh, chapter 36. And I just want to show you this real quick. I told you that Timnah, the Horite, or the Kuri, 
she went to Jacob and his sons. I'm assuming that she wanted to be a concubine to one of them. They saw her and they said, uh, get away from us, get away from us. There's just something about her that didn't sit right with them and they didn't want nothing to do with her. And then she ended up taking Esau's son, Aliphas, and then bore to him Amalek. But she was trying to get with them, with one of his sons, and they were like, nah, we good. <laughs> I'm just saying, we got to have the same attitude. Our ancestors obviously saw something wrong with her, didn't want nothing to do with her. So, you know, just keep that in mind. But let's look at verse 27. And the children of Lotan were Hori, Heman, and their sister Timnah. That is Timnah, who came to Jacob and his sons, and they would not give ear to her. And she went and became a comp concubine to Aliphaz, the son of Esau, and she bare to him Amalek. So this woman is who brought forth Amalek. Amalek is another descendant of the fallen. She obviously wasn't fully human, as we've already proven in this study. So that's pretty much all I wanted to show you in this section. I'm going to come to the last section of this. We're going to come to a conclusion. We're just going to close out this video. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and let's get back to it. All right, so my final thoughts on everything that we brought forward. So first I wanna explain why I did this because I noticed there is a lot of denialism about who so-called black people are, who the Negroes are, especially here in America and those who are descendants of the slave trade. I literally had somebody on my, my last video say, it's not about color and Esau is anybody that you know, hates Jacob and that can be anybody. And, and in a sense that is true, but there are people that descend directly from Esau. And I understand there's a lot of hatred of who we are. And it's so interesting to me because it's so many people that accepted the Ish people and didn't question them or anything else. But as soon as black people who came with scripture, because by the way, the, the, the Ish people, they never came with scripture to prove who they were. They never even came with a DNA test to prove who they were. But now that we can prove it with scripture and with DNA and with actual history that hasn't been colonized and whitewashed, all of a sudden everybody got a problem with it. But y'all accepted the Ish people without questioning anything about them. And so I'm honestly just tired of the denialism. And I want these people, because it's mostly the wild men and descendants of the wild men that, that always are trying to deny who we are. And, and I brought this forward to show you your history to show you where you come from. That's why you, you have such a hatred towards us that you can't explain. That's why you go to such effort to try to act like you guys are above us when you're not. Can you be grafted in? Can you accept the Messiah and, and be grafted in? Yes, you can. Because if we go, we're gonna just look at some scriptures real quick to prove that there there is, I, I don't wanna make this video making you think that there's no salvation for anybody that is of this bloodline. This is 1 John, or Yahukanan Rishon, uh, chapter two, verses one through two. It says, my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahusha Hamashiach, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So anybody can, accept Yahusha HaMashiach and be grafted into this. And another evidence I'm gonna give is in the book of Romans or Rumayim, okay? We're gonna just go there real quick. And we're gonna go to uh, Romans 3, chapter 29. Is he the Alua of the Yaudim or the Jews only? Is he not also of the other nations? Yes, of the other nations also. Okay, so we have plenty of evidence here that other people can be grafted in. I know some Israelites don't agree with that, but I go off of what the word says, not what I feel, not what I think. This is Galatim or Galatians 329. And if you belong to Mashiach or Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And then, of course, we've got one more scripture I'm going to give is Romans 11. Because that talks about the grafting in. And I think people need to be able to fully understand what this means, okay? So let's look at this. 
actually, I'm sorry. This is, uh, yeah, Romans 11, and we're going to start off at verse 13. For I speak to you to the other nations, inasmuch I am the apostle of the other people, and I magnify my office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and I might sit some of them. This is Paul talking about Yasharal. For if the casting away of them shall be the reconciling of the world, what shall the re receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first, full, first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, that's Yasharal, and you being a wild olive tree, the Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with the partake of the root of the fatness of the olive tree. Number 18, boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root bears you. He will say then the branches, Yasharal, were broken off that I might be grafted in. But because of unbelief of our ancestors, they were broken off and by you stand by Amunah or belief, be not high-minded but fear. For if Alua spared not the natural branches, Yasharal, take heed he also not spare you, the Gentiles. Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of Alua, or Yahuwah, on them which fall severity, but towards your goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall also be cut off. In verse 23, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for Alua is able to graft them in again. So this is what people need to understand. Stop wasting so much time denying what the scriptures say. Stop wasting so much time denying Deuteronomy 28, denying Leviticus 26, saying it doesn't matter. Stop saying that. It does matter. Because if it didn't matter, there wouldn't be so much evidence of the most high revealing this stuff in scripture. There's plenty of scriptures that prove we are the Israelites. You can't change that. There's nothing you individuals from these other nations can do that you have to just accept it. But I literally made this video to show you where y'all come from. Because a lot of y'all don't want to accept the truth because you have this Edomite blood in you. That's why you hate us so much. But the truth is, I'm trying to show you that you can be saved. You can be grafted in. But you have to get that hate out of your heart, even though it's in your blood. And you're going to always wrestle against the spiritual because there's a, a part of your DNA that wants to hate us. This is why it's so important to experience a new rebirth in Messiah Yahusha. Because Yahusha said himself, if you despise me, my people, you despise me, and you despise the Father that sent me. Get that hate out of your heart. Get it out. And as far as when it comes to Yahshua, I don't hate all of these people, these people from these other nations. I accept those that accept us and accept our Messiah and accept our Father. Across my channel, I've got all type of people that come to the ear to hear these teachings, all type of people that come and listen to my music. And I never discriminate against anybody about the color of their skin and told them they, they, they can't be saved. That has never come out of my mouth and it never will come out of my mouth. And to the Israelites that follow me, that think that something's wrong with me saying that, I don't know what to tell you. I've been very clear about this in the beginning that I do believe other nations can be saved. But they have to accept the truth and boast not against the natural branches. To you Gentiles, get that hate out of your heart. Get it out. You won't make it into his kingdom cleaving to sour cream supremacy. It doesn't work that way. I know plenty of white people that accept the truth, have no problem with this information being brought out because obviously the, the individuals in power don't want you to know this, but it connects to the scripture directly and we can't run away from that. So I hope this video has been edifying and helped you guys realize that there are people amongst us that are not 100% human which is why we have to be grafted in, especially the other nations, because a lot of them are descendants of the fallen. And Yahusha commanded us to preach the Bashura, or the good news to all creatures on this earth. And that's what I'm doing. But first we gotta bring out the truth. Now that the truth has been presented, you make a decision about whom you serve. This is Yaksher Malkaya. All scriptures shared in this video will be linked below. And I hope to see you guys soon. All esteem to the Most High Yahuwah, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Shalom.